for the session of the Dunedin City Council. Uh, it's nine o'clock and time for us to be underway. We have a very large public forum this morning, uh, I'm sure with lots of interesting things to present to us. But before that, we have our opening karakia from, not here, Tania. Cherie Williams, there we go, <laughs> from Marae Te Uru Marae, who will open the meeting with a karakia and a small presentation. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Jules, and maybe we'll get, have a coffee so you can solidly remember my name and who I am. Ha manu e Tui Nō reira e mihi ana ki a tātou e hui hui mai nei kei raro i te tūnui o tēnei whare mō te kaupapa tino, mō tēnei hāpori o oti puti i runga i te whenu o te wai paunamu. Nō reira e mihi ana ki a tātou katoa. E mihi ana ki te mana whenu o tēnei rohi. Nō reira kore e motu aku mihi ki a rātou. E mihi ana ki te kaupapa i te wikena, he waka pūtanga. He aha tērā, haere koutou ki te... Whai, hea ha te āhua tango o tēnā kaupapa. I taua wā o oku tūpuna, e hui hui rātou i roto i ngā waka menenga. He ha aua kaupapa, he orite i tēnei kaupapa o te wāne. Nō reira, e mihi ana ki a koutou. So just before I've begun my karakia whānau, I just wanted to acknowledge the signing of the Declaration of Independence. He waka pūtanga. First in time, best in law. That declaration was the first official paperwork that was signed here upon this land in Ngāpuhi in 1835. If you don't know what the Declaration of Independence is, best you find out. It's time to know about these things. If we don't know, then we're sitting in ignorance, and it's not time for ignorance anymore. It's time to build a positive future for this next seven generations that will come after our time. Nō reira, waihotia aua kōrero i reira me karakia tātou. Kia inoi tātou. Kia ora. Kōri hi te manu, tākiri mai i te ata, kao, kao, kao a te atihe mauri ora. Kia tau rā nā mana ki tanga te runga rawa ki te nā ki te noa tātou e tau nei. Kia tūturu o fiti whakamaua, kia tīna, tīna, haumi e hui e taiki e. Please repeat after me. Mā te atua. 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 Tama. Tama. Mā te atua. Mā te atua. Wairua tapu. Wairua tapu. E manaki. E manaki. E tiaki. E tiaki. I ngā wākato. In a wakato. Amine. Amine. Etu tata mo te kahimine. Etu. Eto runga mea. Nga mea nunui. E ki ana. Nga matua. Tumana ko. Vaka pono. Ko te mea nui. Ko te aroha Tūturu waka maua ki a tīna Tūturu waka maua ki a tīna Haumi e hui e Taiki e Mari ora ki a koutou, e noho Thank you for the opportunity to present this karakia And to begin your day Kei raro o te koro ai te atua Mihi atu ki a koutou katoa Kia ora Alrighty, so now we have uh, the first of our public forum presenters, Mr Neville Martin, who will talk to us about the physio pool. So uh, how it works, you have five minutes, yes, 
um, five minutes to speak and five minutes to take questions. It will be uh, <coughs> timed by with the, uh, the little uh, inset that you see on the screen above uh, for the five minutes. And uh, if you, you don't need to start the microphone at the moment, but the microphones work by being pre the, pressing the button in the middle to start. And so if someone else speaks and asks you a question, your microphone will be switched off. And so you have to press the button to speak again. So that's how it works for everyone in the room. So you just press to speak. You don't have to turn it off. You just have to press the button to start speaking. Anyway, there we go. You're all set. Your five minutes. You begin as you wish. I've pressed the button to start. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor and councillors, ladies and gentlemen, Tena Koto, I'm Neville Martin. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Otago Therapeutic Pool Trust, which has operated the physio pool in Dunedin. I want to brief you all about what is happening to the physio pool. I have a briefing paper which I've distributed to councillors and I propose to read that briefing. The physio pool was operated by the Otago Therapeutic Pool Trust as a public swimming pool from 1983 until 2021 when it was forced to close because of equipment breakdown. The building and equipment was owned, are owned by Te Whara Ora. Prior to COVID-19, pool attendances were approximately 40,000 per year. In addition to people who are rehabilitating from injury and surgery, there was a wide range of pool users, from children and adults learning to swim, through to those swimming, aqua jogging and exercising. The pool was accessible for physically disabled through some on-site parking, level entry changing rooms and a hoist. This year, with the involvement of Council and Te Whara Ora, the trustees of the Trust are undertaking a feasibility study to determine the future of the pool. <coughs> the feasibility study is examining what is required to upgrade the infrastructure of the physio pool and to make it financially viable to enable it to reopen. The feasibility study is also investigating an alternative site option for a new public hydrotherapy pool including one with additional features, such as a spa pool, sauna, steam room and gym. The costing of these three options is in progress. Next month, the trustees will commence community consultation through a public survey. Results of the survey will be made available to the public. It is expected that the feasibility study will be completed early next year the trustees will then consider the recommendations arising from it. At this stage, and in your deliberations on the draft 10-year plan, the trustees seek your support for the provision of a public hydrotherapy pool, either through the redevelopment of the physio pool or one on a different site. The trustees would like to make, would like the opportunity to provide a submission to the draft 10-year plan. Attached for your information is a, a flyer to promote the feasibility study survey and a concept plan for a new hydrotherapy pool as a basic option and an enhanced option. Now, mihi, thank you. Thank you. Now we have questions. Firstly, uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Martin, thanks for all your efforts on behalf of the user community, myself, myself included. Um, I understand, and, and I must say that no one underestimates the complexity of dealing with Te Whata Ora uh, and an old building. However, I understand there was an offer made before the SDHB ceased to exist of assistance with um, capital equipment purchase and um, some sort of longer term tenure. Is that, that still the case? Is that offer still on the table? Uh, Councillor, uh, a lot of water has flown under the bridge since then. A new organisation is in place. Uh, we are working with Te Whara Ora in the feasibility study. The, the offer of assistance has changed 
um, because there are certain restrictions about the use of that site. Um, principally, the hospital site master plan involves another building adjacent to the existing physio pool on the car park. Uh, there will be restrictions on car parking and there may be issues with um, steam availability for heating the water. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Martin, for, for coming and speaking to us. Um, you'll be aware today that this item's on, on our agenda, I think it's item 11, you're aware of that? Yes. Um, and in, uh, in that um, item today, I think it's, it makes mention of the hydrotherapy pool, uh, uh, pool at uh, Tepuna of Whakahehu, the Mos new Mosgiel pool, and it mentions the fact that's not meant to be a replacement uh, for the physio pool but does provide some facilities. Would you pretty much agree with that statement? Yes, it does provide some facilities. It also provides uh, a number of pools for the Mosgill community. Uh, I'm not sure that the, the people who have been using the physio pool would use the Mosgill pool or even Moana pool because of, its, uh, because of the restrictions at those pools, um, particularly um, in relation to the types of people who would use the physical pool. Thank you. We've covered the questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mayor. And now we have uh, Rachel Elder and Sarah Davy Nitus to talk about the Dunedin Trails Trust. Councillors, public. I'm Sarah Davy Natus, and this is Rachel Elder, and we're here to speak on behalf of the Dunedin Tracks Network Trust. Uh, so, tracks and trails in Dunedin. Sometimes I think the more I get my head in this space, the faster my head starts to spin. There's so much interdependent work streams going on. It's awesome, but it can be totally mind blowing. To illustrate the point, in case you think I'm losing my marbles on a Monday morning, is the Regional Land Transport Plan, Shaping Dunedin Transport Programme, Integrated Transport Strategy, Carbon Zero Plan, Strategic Review of Walking and Cycling Networks, Destination Plan, Iteration 5 million, and the DCC 10-year planning process. So at the departmental level, we're looking at transportation, parks and recreation, planning environment, community development and economic development. So there's no doubt that tracks and trails within the Dunedin City Council is interdisciplinary. And that's only the work occurring in the Dunedin City Council. The Regional Council's also got related work streams. The government has national programs, which are apparently a bit up in the air at the moment. The Department of Conservation has programs. And there's also community organisations specifically working in this place. The Tunnels Trail, Mountain Biking Otago, the Tyree Trails Group and the Coastal Communities Cycle Connection Group. So at the end of the day, uh, with all this work going on, there's no doubt that shared trails have a really important role in building a great small city. Shared trails will contribute to healthy active population, connected communities, environmentally sustainable communities and economically thriving communities. We have a small population with limited funds, but we can make this happen. We, the Dunedin Tracks Network Trust, want to help you make these trails happen. We think working in silos will be costly and counterproductive, but working collaboratively is the way to go. 
So what are we doing here? Uh, we want to maintain regular dialogue with you about progress and where we're at, what we're up to. So what are we doing? We're talking to people about trails, anyone and everyone. Rachel is particularly focused on this, you may be aware. We're fast developing a framework for prioritising trails and sections. We've nearly achieved an MOU between ourselves, yourselves and the Department of Conservation. We've developed a website, which is looking fabulous, we believe. It's about to go live. We're just pending trustee sign-off next week. We've identified five trails, which we are thinking will be the first cabs off the rank, dependent on community group involvement, identified need, funding potential, landowner enthusiasm and the likes. So you can see there there's Coastal Community Cycle Connection, Tyree Trail, Outram to Hinden, South Coast, Cargill's Castle to Tunnel Beach, and then possibly around the Coastal Peninsula. On our website, and as a key part of our uh, modus operandi is uh, providing a platform for these community-led projects to tell their story. We've also started meeting with funding organisations with charitable status and via our website we're able to receive donations and we're working to support both the coastal and the Tyree communities to develop their respective trails and this is where we see it getting good this is the exciting bit as we get into the nitty-gritty of working with these communities we find activated committed driven locals locals who want to contribute their time their expertise to write resource consents, gift parcels of their land, donate funds to build a certain section, or build, help build one segment. With a coordinated collaborative approach, building these trails doesn't need to come at a great cost to Dunedin ratepayers. The potential of these local communities will become more evident when Emily speaks of the Coastal Communities Group and provides an update on their trail. Don't get me wrong, we totally need council support to get these going. So we are asking for, in your long-term plan deliberations, that you recognise these five proposed trails in your work streams. You provide a base level of funding so we're able to leverage your support. We commit to both the Northern Cycleway and the Tyree Trail in the Regional Land Transport Plan and we establish Dunedin's shared trails as a legitimate form of tourism. Thank you. That's really good. Now, do we have any questions? Councillor Fisol. Tēnā koe, Mr Mayor. Tēnā korua. Um, Kia kaha for uh, your mahi going on going forward. Um, just uh, checking, have you given consideration to um, in advancing your trails work, uh, looking at mana whenua names for the trails? Uh, that's well down the line. We, we understand we're starting uh, communications with mana whenua, um, definitely needing to be a wee bit more down the line. We see incorporating the history and the stories of the land being a major part of the trails. They have a lot of potential to establish um, stories about our ecology, biodiversity and where we've come from. Okay. Councillor Walker. <laughs> Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks, uh, guys, for coming in. Um, two questions from me, and the first question is in the context of the fact that I was one of the speakers at your recent presentation in Mosgiel. Um, and, Sarah, you mentioned um, landowner enthusiasm. Um, how does one, I guess, address and, and work with landowner opposition? So the Tyree Trail is an interesting... Uh, and it's a dichotomy when you compare it to the coastal communities one. It, it's important when you look at the three sections of each trail, and so the Tyree Trail is important that it links from the tunnels at Wingatui to Waihola, and that we've got that connection with the Great Trail. But a key uh, 
leg, if you like, of that trail is Outram to Mosgill. And so a, the key landowner in there is the ORC, and so we're working closely with them. And, and so I think as far as dealing with landowner disapproval or disinterest, we c trails can only go where they're wanted and where they're able. And so we work alongside communities to build a trail where they're wanted. Okay, I think you vaguely answered my question. Um, so the second question is, and this will happen as we approach next year in the long-term plan, and you, you mentioned um, base level funding. Are you in a, I mean, is that something that will become, that amount will become clearer next year, or do you have numbers in your head? We, we, we were looking at a base level of 250,000 a year. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, at the moment, um, the DCC funds mountain biking 80,000 a year for maintenance, and the return on that, um, Benji Patterson said, was 16.7 million. So um, we think um, a return on 250,000, it enables us to go to trusts and to go to the ORC at, to leverage that funding. So we're looking at a stage which is 1.2 million. If you give us, if, if, if the council commits to 250,000, we can, actually make that four times as much. We've got a, a trail ready that's worth 1.2 million. We will leverage that 250,000 to get that money. So it's actually money well spent. But we've got a different state. We, we're doing stages and so a stages over 10 years means that we need that money um, for for um, planning, for resource, consent for um, detailed plans of trails, um, for project management. So um, all, there's a number of things that have to happen which all need to be funded. But at 250,000 a year, um, we can leverage that exceedingly well for the city. Um, thank you. I think my question gave you a, a, a grade in there to, to do some marketing, Rachel. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else asking a question? Because I have one more if there's not. Uh, there is another question. Okay, but we're going to go I'm, 30 I'm seconds either. Okay, it's Councillor Houlihan, and 30 seconds. Thank you. Yes, sorry, there's a lot of people I know. It's quick. Um, so the Tunnels Trust, I think they got quite a lot of money, didn't they? That a while ago, was there 11 million, or did that? There was mon quite a lot of money that was awarded. I remember quite a long time ago, but I think a few was it last year it came that there was some recognition of it again. But w where is that at with that situation with the funding for the tunnel? Because I think there was millions there, wasn't there? Yeah, that's what I think. Yes, so we'll have a yes or no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the, because we could the, have the tunnels is very well in your transportation budget. Uh, this, these are trails um, where we are looking, establishing them with support of your transportation budget, but also in the tourism space, the parks and recreation space, the active communities. The, so this is, our funding may be transport related, but it is interdisciplinary as... Right. Thank you. Uh, 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 Councillor uh, Lulan, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. And next we have Simon Noble, also to talk about cycling. Kia ora koutou, um, <coughs> greetings councillors and also I'd like to greet the mana whenua o tēne, ra, o tēne rohe, um, it's great to be here. So my name's Simon Noble, I um, live in Dunedin, I'm a cycling and tourism recreation consultant, done a lot of work in, um, on the cycle trails in particular and um, on governance aspects 
in asset management, in marketing, and planning, and so on. And I'm deeply concerned about the development of the network um, around the city and the way that it's being planned on a hodgepodge basis, despite the massive potential that is that is available. So, and I speak with some circumspection, though, you know, just aware of just how much volunteer effort goes into all of that, um, and because it's um, sort of speaking against cycling, feels a bit odd to do especially for a mad keen cyclist um, and a cycling consultant. And I have, I should say, I've ridden all but one of the great rides in New Zealand. I've ridden into and out of almost every city in New Zealand on my bike, on multi-day bike tours. So I have a strong sense of what is a good ride into or out of a city or a place and what makes these things work. Um, there's already a cycling connection official from uh, Waihola to Moskiel. It's that pretty faint line that you can see there. Um, it's, one, it's under the New Zealand Cycle Trails banner. It's not a great ride. The great problem with recreating out there is that horrible gap between Altrim and Allenton and the fact there's no way of getting across the river. This is the route proposed um, by the trails group in Taieri and was also on the map I saw before in the last presentation. Um, I think it's far, far too long. Um, it needs to be much more direct than that. Um, just quickly, it's broken into three stages. As Sarah said, costed at about $12 million for 45-ish kilometres, as shown there. The real critical area is this gap between Waihola and the uh, crossing of the proposed crossing of the Taieri at um, where the Silver Stream stop banks come in. If you roughly, this is pretty rough, if you roughly map out what the length of those two options might be at the moment, the shorter option is 10 kilometres, 10 kilometres shorter. It may, it may be more or less, um, this is, these are pretty rough. Um, and I think again from my experience that people are going to find they arrive in Waiholder after three or four days riding from Queenstown, this ride we all want them to come and do, they're going to see that, the route in the previous slide and they're not going to be very happy about having to go all that way including across intensive dairy farming so I'm proposing that there should be a much straighter route the critical area I really want to focus in is on inside the square here where the crossing of the Taieri is this is it you can I tried to make these bigger could have made them bigger by the looks of it off to the top right there you've got the st stop banks to Mosgill and to the left you've got the proposed trail to Outram the solution is a bridge across the Taieri here and then um, travelling up through that blue area and the pink area is legal road and the blue area is a hydro parcel of land and as it was proposed on the 12th September meeting that Steve says he went, that Steve was at, um, this unformed legal road you can see here would be traded off to allow that bridge to happen and I, um, I would be strongly opposed to seeing that happening because it breaks the option of the straight ahead to Waihola that we already, in a sense, joining up with what we already have, it would break the direct route. It also breaks the route to the airport, and it cuts Allenton people out of the whole picture as well. Unless we use the one by the river, but that goes right by somebody's house. This is what it looks like on an aerial photo. I've got no idea how my time's going here, by the way, but um, I feel like I'm going quick. You've got one minute left. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah, this is how it looks in an aerial photo. Um, you can see the unformed legal road goes right through the middle of not just, it looks like paddocks. Not, not, um, there is a line of power poles seemingly on that boundary there, which may be a, a, good, a better place. Um, and look, I'm really circumspect as well that there, there are affected landowners in this. And at the moment, there's some pro protest, <laughs> protest activity going on about the proposal that was made on the 12th of September, partly, I think, because of the process. So I'm really circumspect about that, but I'm, I'm so concerned about this loss of the straight ahead option. So here it is again, the line that just came up on the screen going north is the line we currently have. I'm suggesting strongly, this is, doesn't look so great, is that we should have that straight ahead option through the purple circle. There's a much better way um, to make this work than the one that is proposed. And why would you, why would you put a bridge on the Taieri between the two blue dots at the orange dot and not allow people to go straight, straight ahead when they cross. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, so we have some questions. Our first one for me is how would you get across State Highway 1? And you don't need to in, in that model, you don't need in to. In your one, you took the straight line 
had you going across State Highway 1 by my... I, I haven't looked in detail at the end of the route, but it, it could possibly end up being the same as the proposed Stage 3 of the, the Tyree Trails Group's route. Um, it could be a clip on it by the highway bridge or a separate bridge or an, even an underpass. I'm not, I'm not sure that those options were thoroughly looked at because there seemed to be such a strong desire that this has to go through Outram um, that, that it's created the um, antagonism and the long route. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thanks once again. Thanks, Simon, for coming in with your, your extensive knowledge. Um, there's lots of talk uh, around the quality of the cycle network and Dunedin or the improvement of it. What do you think um, of the quality of Dunedin's current cycling offering? Um, we, we now have, with the harbour... Oh, I have to do this. <laughs> we, I think we now have, with the opening of the harbour trail... A, I mean, it's so easy to say, but a truly globally significant cycling experience. And it's far and away the best urban cycling experience I've ever done in, in New Zealand. Wellington Harbour will have something similar in time with the electric ferry. Cool. But it won't be better. Um, our mountain biking track network is, is really falling apart. It's way, um, way too difficult. Um, it's well served by having a van up to, uh, like a shuttle option up to the top of Signal Hill. That's good but the network itself is too difficult and it's falling apart. And the urban network, I would suggest to people they come to Dunedin and bring a bike and ride around town and should feel pretty safe, but yeah, it needs... We might be at peak cycle trail, but we're nowhere near at peak cycle lane. So that said, how do you... How would you suggest we get a better outcome if that's... The thing that your, always your mic. Seems, oh, okay. The thing that seems to be missing to me is network level planning. Stand back, long term view, network level planning, looking at the whole thing at once. Um, what seems to be happening more and more around the country is that we're making these one off decisions to extend great rides, extend great rides. We even extend the Hauraki Rail Trail till it's no longer in Hauraki and it's no longer a rail trail. So we're not doing this in a comprehensive way. If I had a plea to you, um, it would be to fund or lead, to lead, actually forget funding, to lead such a comprehensive plan. And finally, if I, if I may, um, I jealously heard you saying you've cycled into or out of uh, most New Zealand cities as a bike packer. Um, in, in, in that context, how does, how does Otapoti compare? Well, at the moment it's... But Mike again, you'll get used to this. I'll get used to this, if I ever do this again. At, at the moment, oh, it's, it's rubbish, it's difficult, but, but it, that's a historical accident. It's not, you know, it's not a failure, but it's not that great. The hill does not help. It's very difficult. It's no great to ride riding over that hill, almost no matter how well you build it. Um, the tunnels are really going to help. They, they are... Not only would be a great route, but they're a great thing in themselves. Intrinsically, tunnels will be like ferries or you know other certain other things were really going to light people up. Some of the other cities, some of the other rides into and out of some of our cities are fantastic. Um, Wellington, Nelson, Auckland on the northwestern motorway, Palmerston North, even Invercargill. Arriving in Invercargill is pretty cool. Great. Thank you. Another one? Um, I do. Again, I was going to leave it to others, but I do have one more question. Okay, it goes back to the question I asked Sarah around the landowner's objection, and part of the question was to tease out the, what I described the higgledy-piggledy route. Um, and I'm, I'm not in disagreement with you, but um, why, why, I mean, why would that higgledy-piggledy route not be suitable? I mean, you sort of alluded to it, but I'm just trying to tease that out. I think the thing is, it's just it's just straight out too long. It also, um, I know there's talk about avoiding intensive dairying, but it, it doesn't. And all around the country, a lot of the great rides have quite a lot of, right. they're touching right up against industry, and not all of it's pretty. And I think we need to make a better product. And I come at this whole thing from a customer service perspective. You know, economic development will follow from successful product. Is my is my kind of take on it, so yeah, it's it's too long. Great, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. It's very good.
At this stage, I'll move that Council extends public forum beyond 30 minutes. Seconded, Councillor Mayhem. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Carried. So, uh, next, uh, also to talk about cycleways and cycling, we have Emily Cooper. I think you're familiar with the button. I think so. Yes. <clears throat> right. Kia ora koutou. I'm Emily Cooper from Coastal Community Cycle Connection Group. We are a 533 strong group with a vision to connect the communities of Waikawadi Karatane and Warrington Waitati with shared use pathways and to connect these communities to the city. Is this microphone working? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Okay. So today I'd like to update councillors on our progress and ask for support over the 10 year plan process. Firstly though, congratulations on adopting the Carbon Zero Plan 2030. Reducing transport emissions will be key to achieving this vision. Congratulations also on the completion of Te Ara Moana along State Highway 88. What an asset. Recently, the juniors from Kalatane School went on a field trip to bike this new shared pathway. They had a blast. Afterwards, one of the children commented that they wished that their class could bike to the library in Waikoiti instead of taking a chartered bus each time. That journey is four kilometres each way. It may seem like a small thing, but all these short trips and vehicles add up to paint the picture we currently see ourselves in. So what progress have we made and how can the council help? With the feasibility study <laughs> um, completed for the Coastal Community Cycle Connection, we are embarking on getting shovel ready. So resource consents, easements and detailed design processes have begun. A public meeting in Waikoiti in July was well attended by over 70 people, including landowners, MPs, councillors from the DCC and ORC, and members of the Runaka. It was a great positive vibe and everyone is excited for this project. Otago Regional Council has granted us fees-free resource consent processing for the Waikoiti River Rail Bridge clip-on. We're waiting on several design and build quotes to come in and then this consent application will be lodged. The first section to be constructed though will be the section from Waitati to the Orokanui Eco Sanctuary. With no DCC fund for consent processing fees, we expect to raise these funds locally with the website donations that Sarah spoke about uh, through, um, through that facility. Next will be Orokanui to Port Chalmers. Uh, we just need to apply for approval to use the railway corridor above Port Chalmers from Kiwi Rail and we're hoping that the West Harbour Community Board will approve our request for funds for that. <laughs> There'll be a plan B if they don't. However, the main crux of my appearance today is to acknowledge that the DCC has included the Northern Cycleway, that's us, in the transport plan submitted to the 2024 Regional Land Transport Plan in August. 31,530,000 for future National Land Transport Plan budget to connect northern coastal communities to each other and to Dunedin with a walking and cycling trail. This is exciting news because it means that we can be eligible <coughs> for government funding down the track, especially if we're shovel ready as we plan to be. The Regional Land Transport Plan represents the projects, programs and activities that DCC will request Waka Katahi co-funding for. Waka Katahi normally co-fund DCC projects at a funding assistance rate of 51 to 90%. <clears throat> it's important to note that the State Highway 88 Harbour Cycleway Te Ara Moana, Port Chalmers to Dunedin, was funded 100% by Waka Katahi. Including a project in the draft Regional Land Transport Plan does not require Council to fund it through the 10-year plan process. 
However, if the council does not allocate the council contribution local share through the 10-year plan process, the project will not receive funding from the National Land Transport Fund. Therefore, this is an opportunity that should not be missed. I urge the council to support our project. We are doing all the hard work to minimise the cost to the council and ratepayers for maximum benefit. By simply including the Northern Cycleway in the 10-year plan budgets, another string to the bow can be added to our fine city's network of pathways for residents and visitors' enjoyment, providing safe, accessible and low-carbon active transport options for all. Thank you. Thank you. And questions? Councillor Mayhew. Thank you so much, Emily, for all your mahi so far. Has it been three years you've been working on this project? Yeah. Um, so do you think Waka Kotahi will fund the stretch along State Highway 1, Waitati to Warrington? Uh, I believe so because there's no option um, but to ride along State Highway. Yeah. And one more question, how much money would I have to spend or donate to the project to name a stretch of the cycleway after myself, you know, Mayhem's Trail? <laughs> Just give me a dollar sign, I'll start saving. <laughs> Woohoo! Very good. Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thanks. Again, I promise not to ask questions once we get off biking. Um, Emily, yeah, thanks for all your mahi and the work on the feasibility study. It's great. Uh, so two questions. Where, Because often some of the impediments can be that nitty-gritty that is the consenting process. So how is that going? Where is it sitting? And what's your feeling about the outcome there in terms of potential impediments? Um, yeah. Mike, Mike again. It's, um, it's really just a matter of going through the process. So um, I guess the major impediment is just uh, funding those resource consent applications. Um, it's not something that a lot of funds provide money for. So that's where the donations will come in really handy. Um, OIC obviously has, has already um, provided funding for the uh, resource consent for the Waikawaji uh, River Bridge. Um, well, yeah, it, it's that we, we need to get all our ducks in a row and then we can be eligible for um, funding from trusts. Um, so that's our main focus right now. Yeah. Thank you. And I was a wee bit confused. You mentioned um, the Orokanui to Port Chalmers section and using the rail corridor, which I'm still in my head trying to work out where that would emanate from. But you, you alluded to getting funding from the, the, the West Harbour Community Board. Um, that's a small fund that's dedicated to the rest of the community and is, is nothing, it's petty cash. So can you just explain yeah, that comment? Yeah, and, and, um, and again, the uh, mic. Sorry, they're deliberating on that, I think, at the moment. Uh, look, we've put an application in um, because it, it's relevant to their community, um, connecting up extending beyond Port Chalmers up to um, Orokanui. And that is, um, it cost us three grand for the um, approval in principle from Kiwi Rail for the other two sections that we have received approval in principle for. Um, that's between Waikoid and Karatane and Warrington Waitati to use that rail corridor. So it was, yeah, that we've, we, we, we need to apply for the piece above Port Chalmers using that rail corridor. Um, Waikawari, uh, West Harbour Community Board um, was just first on the list to, to hit them up for, um, for three grand, but I know they have only got ten in total, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, there'll be other options, if not, Absolutely. yeah. Well, there's Mandy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Another question, Councillor Mayhem. Um, on, on the same vein as the um, uh, Councillor Walker's questions about the permitting, would that need to be all of the money straight away? Um, how urgent do you need that permit? Just uh, speaking as the council representative on West Harbour Community Board, because we do have that funding, you know, money to allocate to the whole community. Perhaps it could be broken into two parts, or um, the that that three grand. Yeah, that would be a one. That wouldn't be broken up. That would be a one-off. Um, there is also the yeah the cost of resource consent application to the DCC for um, 
that whole piece as well, for the definitely from, from Waitati to the eco century. Um, that I don't know. That could be about five. It's not. It's an unknown. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. Look, it, uh, even some money towards that from the West Harbour Community Board. I don't want to put that's putting them on the spot. Um, would would be great, but. Um, but you know, I understand it's a small pool, and um, we do have uh, the website about to launch, which will mean that we can take donations in the public. And I know that there's a lot of locals who really want to put their um, money behind this, so we're really positive about that. Wonderful. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Thank you. And uh, next we have Mr. Glenn Standring and Mr. Shirley Balug. Shall I start? Yep. Yes, where you go. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Glenn Standring Tene. This is Shirley Blue. We are uh, residents on Islay Street and we're here to talk about the exciting topic of dust suppression. Um, in the annual planning meeting on the 22nd of February, there was a discussion by Mr Drew and Mr Hogan from the council. Um, and I also want to say too, we understand that uh, those council workers have been instructed to save money. Uh, by the council, um, but in that meeting uh, it was decided to no longer fully subsidise dust suppression and to move to a more user pays model. Primarily it was focused on rural roads. Um, in that meeting Councillor Barker kindly read out um, a note that I'd sent to her about ILA Street um, and Councillors Mayhem and O'Malley also talked about issues around sealing and dust suppression. And the key thing was that nuance would be used in determining which roads would continue to receive full subsidising of dust suppression. And a vote by the councillors was based on that. Um, and it was also noted that these decisions would be made for the public good. And Isle Street was mentioned in that respect. And But unfortunately, I believe um, that nuance hasn't been followed. Isle Street is a suburban public road. It's not a dead-end rural road to a farm um, where you could legitimately claim dust suppression as a business expense. I would say 95% of the traffic on our road now is non-resident traffic, which means 95% um, of the dust pollution is non-resident. Um, and put simply, it's a public road, a suburban street. Indeed, it was on the list to be sealed um, prior to the stadium being funded. And a lot of um, funding, of course, was pulled from um, sealing projects at that time. Um, in essence, it's become a city bypass, um, where if you're, say, north of the city and you want to get to the airport, you will take Islay Street, um, as well as lots of recreational things. I mean, there are like bike tracks up there now. Um, so we have a lot of traffic with people going up with bikes on their back, you know, but in effect creating lots of dust. So I have a petition here too, which I'm going to put into the council, which um, has what I believe is 50, well over 50 people who are directly affected by what, the dust pollution that will follow if it's not, sub dust suppression is not fully subsidised. Um, so look, we just respectfully ask um, that the council reconsider fully subsidising our suburban street and while acknowledging that there are so many worthy projects that, you know, are also demanding funds. But this is basically um, public maintenance. Shirley. Good morning. Um, my uh, questions to the council are my understanding of the council's obligation to maintain public um, streets is to defined in government legislation, and a public street is actually a street that is maintained by either the government or the local authority. That's what the differentiation between public and private is. Um, this, um, that meeting on, in February um, 
where the decision was made to um, charge people who lived on these gravel roads for dust suppression, um, I think was done in isolation um, of the facts. Islay Street is a little a 600 metre a gravel gap in the middle of what used to be a long gravel road, Wakari Road to Leith Valley Road. It's the unsealed bit in the middle. But there's lots of people that are uh, impacted by this who do not live on Ilo Street. There's four other streets that back onto this built up area. Um, there is Wakari Road, <coughs> there's Fulton Road, there's Andale Street, and there is Malvern Street. All these properties back onto Islay Street. There is also at the moment um, a development going on on Islay Street which will, I suppose, uh, end up in more houses. Um, <coughs> the notification for the 1st of September for the timeline for dust suppression, that seems to me to be particularly um, bizarre given that dust is not a problem in the winter. Sorry? I was just pointing at the clock. Oh, for um, the 42 years I've lived on Islay Street, it is always dusty from spring through to autumn. Nothing, that has certainly not changed. Um, now I don't know whether the council actually are aware of the charges that were actually sent to the people um, that were affected. The charges are 1550 per year per ratepayer for buy oil, $6,000 for auto seal. Right, so we're aware, we're, we're aware of those charges. I was pointing at the clock because at that point you had 10 seconds left. Right, but well, my big thing is uh, affordability. Superannuation um, have an income of 30000 a year. Bioseal is 5% of the yearly income. It's 20% of a married couple's income for auto seal. 25% for a single person. Thank you. I ask, is that reasonable? Thank you. We have some questions. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Andale Street, is that a through street? Yes. No. Yes. No. A through street? Yeah, does it, can traffic travel from Fulton Road up to Ilo Street through uh, Andale Street? Uh, there was a washout, and council made that um, so cars can no longer go through it. So it's more of a walk track. Okay, so that leads into my next question because that's the understanding I had too. Um, and so essentially, with the loss of Andale Street and council not doing the work uh, and restoring the road, that's pushed more traffic onto Islay Street. Prob probably not. I mean, I think, uh, as I said before, Islay Street used to, when Shirley <laughs> has lived there for 40 years, and uh, there used to be no traffic going up. There was only resident traffic, so there was no need for dust suppression. Now, there is an enormous amount of traffic that goes up. As I said, and look, we love living in a recreational area, don't get me wrong, um, but people tooling up in their four-by-fours with you know, some bicycles <laughs> strapped to the back of their cars, going to all the um, riding areas up around there. It's just, it's become a recreational area, um, which again is great, but we're having to foot the bill, you know, as, and we already pay our rates. Yeah. Councillor Mayhem. Is, it, uh, is there a potential to maybe put a bund in the middle of Islay Street so that traffic can enter from the top and bottom but not go through? We believe that would be one way round it and that would also um, make it a heck of a lot safer. Another problem with Islay Street is there's a blind corner right um, in the middle of it. And I don't drive on Islay Street if I can help it. I go down the road and go up Fulton Road. It really is dangerous. Um, also, the statistics that were gathered on the street usage said more than 100 people per day, and I believe any road that's used 
um, it's a high rating if it's more than 90 vehicles or through traffic per day. You're saying it's non-residential and that, that statistic was gathered during COVID time as well. And, and because of where the counter was put, people that actually were resident on Islay Street wouldn't have been in that number because the ones that live at the top could go out the top above the counter, the people that live down below would go out below. So that would be simply through traffic. Are you aware that um, some of our other councils have uplifted their seal extension policy? Most recently, Whakatane have put in their long-term plan that they're going to spend 750000 per year on um, seal renewals. That might only equate to a few kilometres of road, but it certainly would cover your street, wouldn't it? I don't want to move to Whakatane, though. <laughs> That's the only problem. I think there was a movement from a lot of councils to um, stop their seal renewals and now that's, um, are you aware there has been some uptake from other councils across the nation to, to renew their seal extensions? I wasn't aware of that but in that February 22 meeting Mr Drew um, made the point that they'd stop sealing uh, because Waka Kotahi had decided that there were too many sealed roads in New Zealand, which, you know. So we have another question, Councillor Milley. Oh, it just relates to um, if the council were to start to establish a policy again. Ilo Street is not just a street that's extent looking for an extension because it's on the edge of the sealed area, but you're also saying that its use has changed over time and, and that the amount of usage on the road has increased dramatically, right? Yep, hugely, hugely. Thank you. All right. That we've exhausted questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, next we have Diane Yeldon. Thank you, Mr Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak. It would have been a lot less stressful if you make sure the venue, the doors to the venue are open a quarter of an hour before the meeting starts. Um, I've got three points I want to make. Um, so they're requests for something that's in your power to do. So I would appreciate if these three points are recorded in a minute, so I haven't got anything in writing. The first one, I'll try to remember, the first one is, your code of conduct was last reviewed in 2016. Um, could you please consider reviewing your code of conduct and making that review open for public consultation? Um, the next point is a request. Could you please consider your protocols and processes for deciding who gets to speak at public forum and when and recognise that this is a governance decision, not a management one. Um, standing orders make various clear provisions for public forum, including restricting the speaking time from five minutes if there's more speakers. Um, I won't say what's happened in the past. I'd just like you to be as inclusive as possible and not leave yourself open to accusations of censorship or restricting people who might say something you don't want to hear. So, um, yeah, that's a, just a clear-cut thing about having a look at your process and accepting that it's political and it's governance. And one thing about public forum is um, there's this issue of stacking public forum. So last triennium, some speakers finished their submission by saying thank you to the Mayor for inviting us to speak because we wouldn't have known it was on otherwise. Um, there was also a public forum where a number of speakers spoke in, in favour of um, the proportional representation. And as you all know, the agenda only comes out two days, two working days before the meeting. So if somebody tells you that something's on, you've got an advantage, not all members of the public who might have quite strong feelings about something and know the meeting's on. Um, 
Uh, so I'm talking about staking public forum. I actually think that it's probably unethical for councillors to invite people who share the political views to come and speak at public forum. A system, I'm sure, certainly. And also, when there's a decision on who speaks at public forum and there's an issue like this where there's diverse opinion or polarised opinion, uh, I would think it would be more inclusive if the public forum wasn't completely composed of one side. Okay, what else have I got? Something nice to say about um, the annual plan, the 10 year plan submission process. Um, the CE has just told me it's a preliminary process, which is excellent because that means it's not so constrained by legislation. I just filled in the questionnaire and I think you've never done better. But I did an ODT search for this and it's not, I didn't find anything in the ODT. Otago Access Radio is just updated apparently and they would be a good place to um, publicise that questionnaire. I like the questionnaire because questionnaires in the past have been a bit stacked like referendum questions. You could, you didn't have, you didn't have such a range. And the other thing I like about it is you used to be in um, Planning Resource Management Act, a cross-submission process where it was a long, very long process where people put in their submissions and then they, they would be made public and then people could read those submissions and either support or, or uh, disagree with them. By making people's answers to the questionnaires public um, um, with their agreement, you, you give people, you remind other people who are going to answer the questionnaire of things that they could mention. When I did the questionnaire, I sort of went through what you're going to spend money on and just followed it. I thought it was really good. But then I looked at what some other people had put, and one person had put, please open the library earlier. And I thought, yes, yes, it's a waste of resource not to have it open until 9.30, because it's not just books people need. There's lots of people, and these include international travellers that's come to New Zealand, use the library's computer resources. So it would be great to have that open at least by 8 o'clock. Now, there's some other things that I've... Uh, oh, actually, I've actually got myself a timer, and I forgot to put it on. So if you'd be so kind as to tell me how long I've, I've taken... 30, 30 I've, seconds. I've, I've, I've only got 30 seconds left. Yes. Um, OK, so I'm just going to mention the change of government. You did a great job defending us from the predations of the anti-democratic last government, but the laws are still there. So there's still a lot of work to be done to defend local democracy. You've got a lot of work to do. Oh, yes, OK, so Code of Conduct. Did I mention Code of Conduct? Yes. Yeah, yes. OK, so it, it's, it's supposed to be not to bring you into disrepute. If you don't use it as an absolute last resort, you bring yourself into disrepute by having them. So uh, minimise as many. Try to try just, just work it out privately. OK, yeah, OK, stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, Councillor Eklund. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, you raised the uh, code of conduct in the review that is overdue, which is coming. Uh, is there something in particular in the code of conduct that you would like either changed, added, or taken out? To press the mic, oh, okay. I thought I was just checking the microphone. Yes, yes, there is. Okay, so the Dunedin City Council has not read its code of conduct accurately. Um, there's been um, procedures in the past that have not followed the, the written word. Um, okay, I, I made a complaint, I made a code of contact complaint against a mayor of Dunedin before 2016. There was nothing in the code that said, and the code of party standing orders so they have legal force. There was nothing in the code that said a member of the public couldn't, and it was processed. So in those days, if there was a, before the 2016 review, if there was a code of conduct complaint, it went to the mayor to evaluate whether it needed to, to you know, whether there was anything in it. If the code of conduct was a complaint was against the mayor, then it was managed by the deputy mayor, just the same way as a point of order is. And in this case, the deputy mayor, and you won't be surprised at this, he found no case to answer. Okay. At the moment, the 2016 Code of Conduct says the only people who can make Code of Conduct complaints are elected representatives in the CE. There's a principle of justice that you're judged by your peers, which means you're equals, okay? So it really should be only elected reps who understand what it's like to be a rep to re elected rep. The reason the CE can do it is not, that's your, this, this council's decision, but it's, it's something that should be examined. Um, because there's this issue about whether the CE is politically independent. 
So in 2016, a, 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 an independent investigator was brought in to take this role of the mayor. But you could call that independent, but you could call it contracted. And I had an information request on how much you spent on that independent investigator, and it's thousands of dollars, which the food bank would like. You don't need to spend that money. Sorry about this answer, but he asked the question. Um, if you can't trust the mayor, I mean, like, independent investigator is rubbish because the CE and the mayor are deciding who it is. So if they were crooked, they could just choose somebody who they wanted. Um, I, I would like to see the code of kind of go, go back to the thing. You trust the mayor to evaluate whether there's anything in it. And if you can just sort it out in private, don't hang your dirty washing out in public because that does bring you into disrepute. And often apology, apology will be quite sufficient. And you, there's no penalty you can do. You can't actually do anything to anybody for a code of conduct anyway. If you take them away from a committee chair, you're disenfranchising the person who voted for them. Okay, so that's, I'll stop. <laughs> Very good. But I'd like public input, yeah. Very good. Are there any further questions? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your presentation. Uh, next, we have Sue Novell and Andy Barrett. Tēnā koutou katoa. Andy Barrett and I, Sue Novell, are speaking on behalf of our Food Network and also Seniors Climate Action Network. There's a widely recognised and growing potential for significant disruption to food supply due to impacts of climate change and geopolitical events on national and international <coughs> food production and distribution. The City Council therefore has a vital role <coughs> in supporting food resilience for citizens. The take home message from this presentation is that we urge the council to create a full time permanent position of food resilience coordinator, separate from Enterprise Dunedin in the next DCC 10 year plan. The reasons for this recommendation are, food resilience is critical and is too important to be left simply to community organisations and volunteers. Food resilience is multidimensional <clears throat> and can't be addressed by different sectors in isolation. Food resilience is complex and it is central to the future wellbeing of the city. Everyone should have access to healthy, nutritious and environmentally sustainable food. It links strongly to DCC strategy re zero carbon plan by 2030 and the city portrait with its social foundations. It thus links to community wellbeing, environment and economic development strategies. There are lots of ways that city councils can support food resilience, food policy councils, food procurement strategies, etc. But fundamentally, taking food resilience seriously means building, supporting and resourcing the capacity to do so. This requires a permanently funded position that would coordinate community-wide efforts to bolster truly sustainable local food production. Thank you. Do you have questions? Do you consider the Dunedin Farmers Market an important part of our food resilience network? Yes, all markets are. We need lots more locally grown food that is um, available for people to buy here, to, to share, to swap, to um, just nourish us here. Are you happy with the level of care? Does the council provide sufficient support for that market, do you think? Yes. We need more markets. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Mr Moon. Thanks for coming um, today. Uh, I think two questions. Um, you talked about the, um, the critical nature of food resilience. And maybe, I mean, I don't know if, Sue, you want to talk about Andy. Can, can you maybe talk about 
an example of that perhaps in the context of COVID and or what happened last night actually in Palestine with the raiding of a, of a food store and just that critical nature of... of, of um, <clears throat> I think probably the, uh, the event that we all ought to pay attention to is the cyclone last year and its effects uh, up in the North Island. We're in a situation now where we are very reliant in Dunedin on food produced in other regions of New Zealand. And in fact, we've seen a significant decline in the amount of food produced locally, particularly on Tyree Plain, for example. Uh, and we need to be aware of the potential problems and the very real problems that could occur pretty much overnight. Uh, our food systems are far less resilient than we like to imagine. We all like to think we can just pop down to the supermarket and buy whatever we want, whenever we want. Uh, those systems are very fragile. Uh, so one of the things I think that we need to be thinking about here is how we start to build capacity in the region. Uh, and this is important not just simply for food production but also for food transportation. If we're going to take uh, zero carbon seriously, we need to start thinking about what we can produce uh, locally and get to our local people uh, with minimum transport requirements. Excellent. Thank, uh, just a f thank you, Councillor Back. Oh, it's a follow-up question, if it's okay. Oh, it's very brief. Because um, it's just around your main request, which I understand is the request that you'll come to the LTP, I assume, for us to fund a full-time food resilience coordinator. Is that correct? I'm just getting that right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a note on that: we've got, we do fund a half-time person, so 20 hours a week on uh, for in the area of food resilience. Could I, could I just comment on that? Um, I think that one of the issues that we've had, and with the, this goes back quite a long way, we, from Food Network, we actually asked for a position. It was a half-time position to be, uh, to be funded, uh, and that did happen. What actually happened, though, was that it was placed within Enterprise New Zealand, uh, Dunedin, rather, and the problem, as we see it, is that that gave the, the position the wrong sort of focus. Uh, it was much more on economic development uh, and not on, uh, not on resilience. And that's why we make this request at the time that we do, because I think that times have changed and that uh, while we appreciate that money has gone into this, we think that the focus of the position has been wrong and that that needs to be reconsidered. <coughs> Uh, I think it's important to make that uh, distinction. That's good. Uh, we're very tight now for questions. Councillor Barker. Two quick questions. Um, obviously, it's said under economic development. Do you think we need a separate food resilience plan, and do you think that should sit under the zero carbon plan or on its own? Uh, I'd leave that for the, for the council to decide. I think that the important thing for this meeting and for the 10-year plan is to consider how important this issue is. It's very real. Uh, we've seen the implications of that already. How it's actually managed and how it's implemented, I think, is, is for uh, you to decide and for staff to contribute to. Um, we, we just have a few... Right, we're doing pre-engagement at the moment, which closes tomorrow. Have you submitted via the um, pre-engagement about this? Because it's good coming to public forum, but we do need written... I've filled out the survey and also we have put in a written um, on the wall. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much and thank you for your presentation. <coughs> and so next we have Sandra Paul from Lotus College. Good morning. Um, I'm known as Sandra and I'm a concerned resident of Dunedin. Um, I've been given the runaround by Sandy Graham, CEO of the DCC, and Kim Barnes. I've been... 
um, sent stock letters which I've written in with my concerns, which tell me that my requests are not taken seriously and it says to me that I don't matter to you. The DCC. We the people voted you into these positions to represent us, which to me means you, you the council bring your ideas to a vote so we the people are aware and have a say on what happens in our city. I'm here because I have put this document here, which I'll leave a copy for you, um, into the, the to Sandy Graham three times yep. over the past months, and I've requested a personal sit down to discuss its contents. I've not been given a time to meet, and the paperwork has not been rebutted. I find its contents very disturbing and wanted to discuss it before I go public with it. However, because I am being ignored, I have the feeling the content is true and accurate. Therefore, it is my duty to advise the public that this rates business is veiled so that the public do not know the truth of what is actually going on. I wanted to give the council, which we now know is a local government registered business with Dun & Bradstreet, the benefit of the doubt. I want to know if you've seen this document and read its contents, and if not, here it is for you. As a local government, there's a lot going on that I find very disturbing. For example, you're charging us for services that you don't always provide. I have two occasions of recycling not being picked up, and I've requested a discount accordingly and have been ignored. No other business can charge for a service they do not provide. So why is it that this business known as DCC can just keep charging without providing what they're charging for? Surely that is against the law. Also in my street, Clyde Street, Roseneat, Reith, the road is sinking and needs urgent attention. I want it fixed. Not sometime in the future, I want it fixed now. If that is what I'm supposedly paying for with my rates. This paperwork here that I have for you is very damning for the council in more ways than one. So therefore, I would suggest you give me the time to go over it with you and for you to explain to me how it does not apply. If I don't get the service I'm asking for and satisfaction that this document is incorrect, I will in conscience need to make it available to all who wish to read it. I've placed this document in the hands of others while I sought its validity. Another point as well, the charges, the changes to our town on discussion with others, it seems most people bewildered how this can happen to our city. You're supposed to work for us. We vote you in and yet you carry on as if you are in charge without our consent. I personally have not consented to any of it. I haven't even had a chance to vote on it. We voted you in to serve us, not tell us what we are going to put up with. Any changes that are going to happen around us need to go to public vote before the changes are implemented. You cannot spend our money on what you decide. We the public decide, it's our money, our city. So I'm going to ask that within seven days I get a request please to go over these documents with you. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I'm sure now we have a chance to read the document. I can't guarantee an answer in seven days. I think that's unrealistic given the amount of workload that our councillors have, but we will get, uh, you will be replied to in due course. Okay, um, can we have a time limit on that please? Because um, I'm not prepared to um, just wait. Look, it took me to get here to talk to you today, five phone calls yesterday to make sure, and I had my name down to speak to you three weeks ago and I had to make five phone calls yesterday and I didn't know until five o'clock on Friday. So that is not good enough. Oh. I want service. I think that, you know, I'm a concerned citizen. This is, this is happening here in Dunedin and we're just getting fobbed off and I don't want to be fobbed off. I really want you to give me, a, a, give me timing, 10 days. 14 I, days. Look, I don't think it's feasible for us to give, or for me at this point, to give you a time frame. But uh, you, all I'm saying is that you will get a reply. Now, and, I, and 
you know, I'll, so I'll commit to giving, making sure you get a reply this year. Well, so that's not going to be good enough for I me. I can't tell you, know, it's... That's, that's just, that, that just does, it doesn't cut the mustard for me, no I'm sorry. There's no point in us having an argument about this now. Yeah. You know, and I think... Well, I'll just do what I have to do then. But um, I'm giving you that opportunity to um, meet with me and talk with me. If you haven't read the document, I think you really need to do so. Yeah, we've commi I've committed to that. Yeah. All right, so... We have other questions. Councillor Vanivas. Can you give us a brief summary of what the document's about? You've made... I think it's, it's very... I think uh, that it's very in-depth and um, it's not something that can be just discussed here in this forum because it is extremely detrimental to the, um, the council itself and I personally would like to just sit down and discuss it and I need to be shown that it is not truthful and if it's not rebutted and it's been sent in to the CEO three times and she hasn't had the courtesy to uh, give me the time to I'm concerned about it I'm concerned about the Dunedin ratepayers I'm concerned about our city and if this document is true we need to actually get to the bottom of this. Can you email me a copy of it? I certainly can, and I will. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Very good. Well, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I'll leave the document where? Uh, someone will. Yes, just leave it right there. We'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Now. Uh, next, we have Mr. Alex Kerr to talk about health and safety. You just push the button on the microphone. Uh, you, you've got five minutes. Yep. Yeah, don't worry, I won't take five minutes. Okay, so. Um, I'm not a cyclist or an environmentalist. I work in the trades. I'm not into predator free. Um, and um, I do feel that some of what the last speaker said um, resonates with me, and that is that I don't feel that I've been consulted on many of the issues or many of the things that are going on with council. So I've come today to talk about uh, council's responsibility um, or responsibilities under the uh, Local Government Act 2002. Um, not all of them, just a couple of them, and that's disclosure and transparency. Um, I should point out that I know some of the councillors here and I think they're all right, So, and I'm not trying to get at anybody. Um, but... Uh, uh, council have a fiduciary duty towards the people that they claim to represent. Um, this can't be doubted. Um, and um, I, I guess my motivation for being here today is that I've, like a lot of people, have felt a little mucked around with all the construction going on in town um, and a number of other things. So... Um, so I'm going to start with the loss of car parks and go back to the disclosure and transparency because I'd like to know if in the last 10 year plan meeting it was discussed that there would be car parks lost because I like cars, I don't want to get rid of my car ever. I don't want to be a cyclist, I'm recently injured, um, I've had to walk five blocks most uh, times that I've needed to get to an appointment in the Westpac block, uh, which is one way now. I know that um, that uh, construction or works were probably part of the reason and that, that that might disappear next year, but I'm still alive this year, so I think a lot more thought maybe could have gone into that because there's just too much happening too many places and it's really putting a lot of people out but um, 
walking five blocks when you've got a sore hip, that, that's, uh, that was the start of my motivation of being here today. Um, so I'd like to know, uh, was the loss of car parks disclosed? Um, uh, was it disclosed that um, uh, at that original meeting that probably was the impetus for gorgeous Dunedin or whatever it is, was it disclosed that there would be, um, that George Street would be a one-way street, you know, coming south from the five intersections, which I think is just terrible. One of the things I really liked about our city is that you could drive right through it and that all the shopping was in the centre of it, unlike any other city in the country, really. Um, anyway, 1 minute 30, OK. So I'll, I'll rush through this. Um, I don't believe that there's better access to shops now. I actually think it's worse. Um, I... Um, um, Hang on, I'm just making my way through this. Right. Okay, the disclosure thing. The other thing that I wanted to know about was how it's all being funded. Um, now, I know that, um, well, I, I remember hearing that there's some 20,000, you know, um, uh, homes that are generating the rates in Dunedin, that could be totally wrong, forget that, but um, I don't see all of this construction coming from our rates. So um, are we borrowing money to do this? And if we are borrowing money, where are we borrowing it from and what are we using as security? It's our city, it's our rates. Um, if any part of our rateable values or our rates are forming part of the security, I think we've got a right to know. So, six, okay. Um, I've just got a couple of things, I'll race through them. Look, uh, uh, so you're down to zero seconds now. So, I thank you very much for your presentation because otherwise we can um, e extend it at length. Alicia, have you got something really quick or you, is he, you covered it because yeah I see a lot more no, sheets no, no, of paper that's, there that's <laughs> fine although I will point out that uh, there have been speakers here that have taken way more than five minutes well, um, but I think you you probably get the gist yeah. of where I'm coming from um, you know uh, I I will say this to finish that I think that if you're going to do any more to George Street or any more of this gorgeous Dunedin, I think you need to get more public input about it to make sure that you've actually got them on your side. I don't think you have. I think you've got a small select group of middle class uh, people that have thought that it's a jolly good idea, uh, it'll fit in with our cycleways, etc., etc. And I've got nothing against cycling, by the way, healthy pursuit. Um, just can't do much of it at the moment. but. Um, I, I really do think there should be more public input. I Thank don't you. think there's any way near enough. Thank you. Now, do we have any questions? We have no questions, so thank you. Thank you for your presentation. All right, okay. I'm sorry it wasn't as positive as you would have liked, but it's, right. uh, it's pretty genuine. Yep. Thank you. And now we have Jennifer Scott. Hello, good morning. You've met me before, I've been here a couple of times. Um, so recently um, I was able to participate in a loo walking tour of Dunedin and Council Barker was there as well. I've always been interested in the history of Dunedin, my hometown, and thoroughly enjoyed learning about pioneer times and Dunedin's creation. A very important part of daily operational requirements was that of the city being provided with public toilets. It was interesting to learn about the underground toilets, the construction, the attendance and the antics that went on around the loos. 
In the early 1900s, Dunedin only provided public toilets for the men, and it wasn't until many petitioned for toilets for women to also be built that this, this came to fruition. The construction of toilets started off using porcelain and brick. They weren't always the cleanest or safest of places. However, the toilets provided an essential service for Dunedin locals. Some of the toilets in Dunedin during pioneer times were underground or above, with trees and bushes surrounding the stairways and entrances. The two most used were in the octagon and the exchange. So today, I'm here to promote public toilets for women. Once again in Dunedin, and for the City Council to continue to provide safe and private spaces for women to use the loo. To be honest, controversy around female-only loos and private spaces has been around for quite some time. In fact, it's a well-known fact that peeping toms have always existed. I really appreciate the central public toilets that have an attendant present. It makes me feel safe. Imagine the people the attendants must meet. Many of the change rooms and toilets around Dunedin have female-only signs. However, it is still imperative that the staff monitor our spaces and uphold sex-based rights. I have appreciated over the years having access to female women only loos around Dunedin and will always support additional upgrades for female only spaces. An example of this would be the toilets at the Woodhall Gardens which are much needed um, of an upgrade. A thought that I also had was to create spaces that are accessible and comfortable for women. I mean, why wouldn't I support loos and change rooms that myself and other females can use? One recommendation that I would like to put forward to Council is that of heated flooring in the female-only change room at the two local swimming pools. I also wouldn't be in opposition of construction of female-only public toilets that have modern and up-to-date fixtures, plumbing and tiling. There's some nice tiling uh, patterns out there at the moment. I mean it's 2023 and we haven't got flying cars so I believe that heated flooring in the female only change rooms going forward so that we have warm feet in the winter time is a really great idea. If you would like to know more about the history of Dunedin Loos you can head to loolady.nz. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, no, I have not. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, that's it. Okay, so uh, there are. We have. Uh, we, that's the end of public forum. And thank you very much for all our presenters. And at this stage, I move that we adjourn for five minutes to have a uh, get a quick cup of coffee, or uh, seconded by Councillor Walker. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against, carried. <coughs>
held on that date as a correct record, seconded, uh, Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Gilbert. <laughs> All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Reports. Actions from resolutions of council meetings, page 39. Is there any comment in advance, Ms Graham? No, Mr Mayor, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, the questions. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, one for the CE. Um, how are we dealing with the open actions from the committee meetings? They've been incorporated into the, these open actions where they have any sort of time frame. Okay. So then I have a more specific question. A resolution from the annual plan uh, that I don't believe was fully reported on, which was around the Peninsula Connection unfunded sections. It was on there. It's not on there anywhere now. Well, I couldn't, fi I couldn't find it. My um, Apologies if it's an oversight on my part, but I just wondered if somebody could give me an update on that at some point. And I'll get someone to provide an update. Here we go. Are there any other questions? Very good, then I'll move that Council notes the open and completed actions from resolutions of Council meetings as attached. A seconder for that. Somebody? Deputy Mayor Lucas. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Forward work programme for Council. October 2023. Any commentary in advance? What I would say, um, in answer to Councillor Gary's thing, it's been transferred to the Ford Work Programme and is showing there. Oh, mm. um, thank you, Chief. I must have missed it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions of the report? Thank you, Mr Councilor. Mayor. I have a number of questions. I will um, start with the, the general one. Last time I asked about the open actions from other committees, like um, infrastructure, there was the Portobello Boardwalk, um, a report back and then a forward work program on the updates on the governance entities, waste futures, a report was due November, waste levy allocation policy um, and shaping the need in future transport and then in the um, spec strategy planning environment committee there are a number of management plans that were due to come in October and I'm just concerned that these are being lost from the forward work program. I can't see them in this forward work program so I was wondering if they are going to be incorporated. My understanding was they had been, and I'll get the governance team to check and provide an update. So and I have uh, four things, I guess, that I've noticed. On page 47, I just wondered what the reason was that there was a change in the time frame for the financial results. We had the September financial results. The Ford Work Programme said that it was coming in October, and now it's November. The staff involved in finalising the September results were also the same staff finalising the annual report, they simply couldn't do both. The next one on page 51, the, has the Octagon report fallen off the agenda? In the progress note it says it's on the agenda, but it's not actually there. So the Octagon report has been um, pushed to an extraordinary council meeting, I think on the 7th of November, that happened after this was delayed because it needs to line up with another report. On page 52, is there any chance of getting the letter of expectation to Dunedin City Holdings timing back to November? Because it doesn't really fit with the timing which we're working on. Usually we try to get the letter of expectation in November because they send out their letter of expectation to the companies in December. So are we able to squish that in? What we're trying to do is um, workshop it first and there's a council meeting I think on the 5th of December which is still quite early in December. So there's an additional meeting. We'll look to do it then. But the the draft and the letter will go out on the agenda um, at the very start of December. So that's the best we can do around time frames, I think. And my last one is on page 53 on the zero carbon. And I was just concerned about the wording, which says that it, um, it's about the high capital investment option. Um, and I didn't think it was just about capital. I thought it was actually about the entire investment options, which included both capital and operational. The, the capital's an additional word. It should be just remove it. It should just say high and medium. Very good. Councillor Melly. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Uh, page 51, the commuter rail... Um, 
consideration for the 10-year plan. It's got December and January consider. I'm just wanting to confirm that that's not considering putting it in the 10-year plan docu um, consultation document, right? It's, it is going into the 10-year plan. Yeah. That was just to give us, I think, some um, flexibility about when the draft document started to come together. Very good. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. I just have uh, two for clarity. One, also on page 51, the shared pathway uh, between Waldronville and Ocean View. Um, I see that it's going to be uh, included in the strategic pedestrian and cycleway network master plan, etc., and that a report is coming in December. But given it, the staff was to work with Saddle Hill Community Board, I'm just making sure that it has been communicated with said community board. I'll just check. Do you know, Anna? No, I'm, I don't know. I can find out. If we haven't, we'll make sure that we do. Yeah. There. Are you getting this? I guess that was the point. Um, number two is similarly down uh, Orokanui Eco Sanctuary. Just wanting an update on that. It's down as uh, work from the last schedule. Just hoping for an update on. Uh, on page 55, right at the very bottom, sort of as the. Um, ad, uh, additional box. Just wanting an update, please. JC? Um, we've got a staff member working with the Sanctuary just around some funding options, so that's ongoing work, and I don't think there'll be a report coming back to Council, it's just work that's being done. Very good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas? Um, thank you. My question was the same as um, Councillor Gilbert's about the eco sanctuary, but I'm and an answer to um, that question. Um, I'm just concerned that if it's dropping off the schedule, um, if staff are still working with the eco sanctuary, I mean, I'm just concerned that if it drops off, that we we lose sight of it. Um, obviously, that you know that was a concern from council. It's, I'm just yeah, we'd like it to stay on. We can add it back in. The resolution is just that staff keep working, but and that's how it becomes operationalised. But I can add it. I can add it back in, but it, there will be no change week month on month. I understand that, but I guess it's just that we don't lose sight of it. And I mean, obviously they. I, well, I imagine they're going to come to the long term plan, um, but I, it's just not to lose sight of it. That, from our point of view, I think. Right. I think we're. We'll see it with questions. Okay, so in that case, uh, I move that Council notes the updated Council Forward Work Program as shown in the attachment included. Seconded Councillor Walker. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item number nine. Community Housing Development Update. So we have Mr West and Ms Nilsson to speak to the report and there will be some prefacing comments starting with uh, Chief Graham. Thank you and this is not related to this report specifically councillors but um, a number of, number of you have commented to me that there are a range of noting reports on this agenda and as you know our practice is not normally to note reports because council is a decision making body. However we felt it important that we formally put a range of reports to Council in the lead up to the 10 year plan process. And so you will see this one, the one on the Edgar Centre, for example, the range of the other reports are to provide you formally with updated information to help inform your consideration of the draft budgets in advance of the 10 year plan. Also, it provides clarity for our community about where our thinking is so that they, there is, um, because the tenure plan process is going to be really challenging with a range of competing priorities. So this is just our way of starting to um, show various of the issues that are going to need to be grappled with. Uh, Councillor Walker. Thank you, if I may, and thank you, CEO. It, it segues into something I was going to bring up at this point anyway. On reading the reports, and I'd like your commentary on this, and it's mentioned allied to some of the reports that a lot of them are very dependent on what emanates in terms of the new government um, and I think as I say some of the reports make that clear but that's my understanding that a lot of them are dependent. 
A lot of them are, and we're in a position where we just can't wait um, any longer before putting some of this material in front of councillors, and we will need to be flexible in then how we deal with anything that flows from any um, new government um, coalition. And we, you know, the votes will be counted on the second, but we don't know the form of the coalition agreement. It may not even be with any certainty um, before Christmas. Who knows? Thank you. Are there any other questions of the report? Yes. No other questions of the report? No other comments? been asked to double check are there any more questions on the housing community housing update report <laughs> yes <laughs> councillor gary uh, kia ora, mr mayor and staff um i just wanted it was a detail around rehousing people as we do these developments and um kia ora for the mahi involved in all of this but is it difficult, is it challenging to rehouse people temporarily? Why? Because they're quite long periods, aren't they, where the building is done and so forth? It's not difficult, but it's definitely something we want to think about. Um, as we take a housing site offline, if you like, we do need to rehouse them. We rehouse them within DCC community housing, and often they choose to stay in their new home. But it just means the more that we do it once, the more we're taking away from our wait list, which is why the program that you've got in front of you takes advantage of two smaller sites straight away to free up new and additional units that will let us do the turnkey one, which is the bigger development coming third. Thank you for that. And my second follow-up question is around uh, the feedback you've had to date. I mean, we've had some of it as we've visited the sites, but how would you characterise the difference this has made in people's lives as they've moved into one of these new, warm, dry houses? Um, Life-changing for some of our tenants, uh, both financially. Their heating costs are significantly reduced both in School Street and in Palmyra, where we've increased insulation in the level of housing we provide. But also we get comments from the likes of School Street that people feel safer, actually because the glazing creates a really quiet environment to live in and it just makes them feel secure. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just, have, um, just a question about the numbers on paragraph two, which is around the estimated cost and the timeline, um, a $10 million of new capital, and I know that we've got $2 million per annum um, of, I guess, new capital put in here. Is that five years capital in there? Okay. There or thereabouts. <laughs> um, and my next question is uh, just around the Fitzroy Street community housing redevelopment in South Dunedin that is planned for 2024. And I just wondered, uh, I, of course you're going to um, work for, for sea level rise. Uh, I just wondered what um, foundations or what size foundations you're putting on for the taking into account sea level rise. They'll be to the building code, so depending on the hazard overlay of the area will dictate how high we have to put those above ground level. So for that Fitzroy Street, there isn't a particular hazard overlay, so it's just to the code. Great. Councillor Walker? Um, Councillor Barker's just asked my very question. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert? Thank you. Quick question. Given <clears throat> the presentation this morning by uh, Sunavel and well, Andy Barrett um, around food resilience, I'm wondering whether any of our developments include any form of shared garden facilities or something to be able to grow spuds or whatever. Um, I'll answer that a few ways, actually. Firstly, there is a couple of community groups that look after food within private dwellings so the likes of School Street has I think two fruit trees there now but they're managed and maintained by a community group which is ideal. The other side of it is on the new sites what we like to do is let our residents move into the site and figure out how they wish to live in the site and how they wish to engage with it. There's space for gardens if they wish to do that and we'll work with them to do it but it's not something we'll actively do straight off the bat ourselves. 
Right, so we're not getting them into the premises and saying you need to look after the, this veggie plot. We say if there's space available if you wish to. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Malley. Mr Mayor, um, I'm just going to raise the accommodation supplement again, um, just more or less to make everybody aware of the fact that we are not able to get it, right? In, in, uh, at the tenants in our, in our buildings are not able to access it, right? Oh, just a wee correction. Our tenants are able to access the accommodation supplement. What, then, what we as council are not able to access is the income-related rent subsidy. Two slightly different things. Sorry, like wrong piece of legislation. Um, I guess if we were and we were able to um, increase our rent higher because we're not charging market at the moment because we're looking at the ability of the person to pay, is there any sense on how much income that would allow us to get potentially potentially get and therefore then potentially apply to new capital investment um, for building a new that's a very large question, Councillor. <laughs> Not one that I'm um, really able to answer now, but I will just point to there's been some changes in that legislation in the last 12 months and to Council's ability to ever get the income-related rent subsidy regardless of this setting, like regardless of we're a trust or not. Like never, as the new legislation changes, is that what it is? Mm. So that then affects Christchurch having formed its housing into a chip then? They're not eligible for it now? It's not retrospective. Obviously that's a lot to ask of you, um, but I think it would be quite useful at some point for us to know what the impact of that government position change has been to us and our ability to produce new housing. Um, I think at this point, and it goes to the Deputy Mayor's um, comment earlier about capturing things and not losing sight of them, if Council wants work like that to be done, I think you should direct staff formally so we can capture it as a resolution then we can track it rather than just um, suggest that we do it because that will also let me help manage workload as well if once we start to see how many requests there are across certain teams. I'm more than happy to do that but I won't do it today or do it as we get nearer the budget. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Councillor Fiso. Tinako, uh, Mr. Mayor. Tinako, um just thank you for my late, uh, responding to my late night um, question and I just thought I'd ask it in public uh, to clarify um, or elaborate on uh, the sentence point 29 universal design principles are used throughout and um, I'm just checking for your confirmation that universal design features include wider access ways and thresholds for level transition zones uh, both inside and outside buildings lever handles rather than knob handles for doors and windows, using drawers instead of cupboards to allow easy access, easy to use drawer handles, good task lighting and utility zones, well-placed grab rails in bathroom areas and non-slip flooring. Yes, that's correct. Um, further to that, further to that um, what is the additional cost of making wider doors in the units than, you know, than minimum levels? Minimal. I don't know the exact dollar figure, but it's, mm. it's literally that much wider, so yes. that much more timber. But making them wheelchair accessible would be a really useful thing for all new houses built in Dunedin, would it not? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Thank you. Um, do you ha work on like a, a benchmark or a, um, a, a per cost um, unit when you're doing looking at these in terms of construction and redevelopment? It, I mean, it's a bit hard. We've obviously got. Um, High level figures because it looks like for the 25 new units it's over 400,000 a unit and for the refurbishment over 300,000. Is that does that about right and is that do you benchmark that as, as a reasonable amount for that? I mean it does seem a lot for 300,000 to refurbish. Sorry I'm just thinking where to start that question. <laughs> We've not, other than School Street which was different because it was a passive house, we haven't done redevelopment as a council for a long time. So no, there's not a benchmark as such. We've set a budget which is loosely 350,000 per unit. Um, the refurbished is probably not the right word, they're demolished and rebuilt. So all of them are new. We just clarify renewals capital or new capital depending if they're a direct replacement or not. 
we haven't gone to market yet. So we've put a budget in that's not solely construction. So that's your design costs, your consenting fees, your contingencies, and everything else goes into that figure. Once we go to market, we'll have a good idea of what things are costing at the moment. Very good. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, it, following on from Councillor O'Malley's um, question around the, the um, income-related benefits that we could get, there's there's an issue, I believe, with a trust that we'd, we'd have to do it in a trust. If But it sounds like um, what you were saying is that we're not allowed to do anything like that. But my question was, and maybe superseded by the fact we can't do it, possibly, is what I was going to ask is what do you see as some of the complications of a trust or benefits? Look, I'm probably better to prepare better to answer some of those questions. I'm not fully up to speed with the changes in the legislation. And to just to further add to that, and it follows on from Councillor O'Malley's question, staff haven't been asked to do this work because the council position is that we currently continue to own the portfolio of housing ourselves. And so until we're asked, I've, I've, staff are not doing that work. That was in relation, obviously, to the uh, for us being able to charge market rents <laughs> and they can then get their rent subsidies and the income-related benefits. That That was what I was talking about. I think you realised that, didn't you? Oh. Okay, yeah. But but maybe, just to follow on with that, it might, because it looked like you said before an answer to that question that we're not able to do that, but it may be, I, I don't know, I'm just putting that question out there, if it was done in a trust, because I know, is it Wellington, I think, or Christchurch? I think Wellington did it, ha, does it and gets the benefit, but they did it in a trust. They had to do it in a trust, I believe, but I could be wrong. Former councillor Elder did a lot of work on it, and I know there was something come up around Wellington um, and a trust. But um, if it was done in a trust, you may not be able to answer this now, obviously, but just putting it out there, that then it would, I suppose, then it might be that it's not a now, our name, I suppose, would be in a separate trust, so that might mean that you could do it because you're not doing it technically as a council. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor the, the, the councillor has already been told that, that the staff can't answer this. Well, it might, it might have been a different... Ah, there might have been a different question coming, so, but then obviously not, so there we go. It's all right. It's the, I was expecting a different question to arrive, but it did not. That's okay. Um, Councillor Mayhem. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to note this report. And just getting back to um, what Marie Lafiso was talking about, universal design. So that also includes uh, wheelchair ramps and access and wet room, wet room bathrooms So f in, in the design. So they're all um, wheelchair accessible showers and bathrooms. <coughs> Just to be clear, universal design means it could be made fully accessible for a full-time wheelchair user, um, but they're universally appropriate. They're not fully accessible, so they don't have all the wheelchair accessible features. But they could be converted to it relatively affordably if needed. Um, well, it's easier to, to incorporate the wider doorways and designs. So are the light switches at a lower level like the handles too to ensure someone seated can reach the switches? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, so we've got 940 units um, and this will take our portfolio to 965. Um, before we're starting to build additional units, are all other other units up to healthy home standard? We'll be up to healthy home standard by mid next year. Um, and another question is, uh, we're looking at uh, the spend on this in relation to the motion from council at the last long term plan. If council elected to change that figure and drop it back to the same million per annum, would that have any impact on this project going ahead? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it will depend where we are in the procurement cycle. So at the minute, we have an existing council resolution and an existing council budget, and we are working against that. And so 
until such time as the budget changes, um, we will be working with it or until council resolves otherwise. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? It appears not. So in that case, I'll move that council notes the community housing redevelopment program update. Seconded, Councillor Houlihan. Sorry, you have a question? Oh yes, so who would like to speak to that? Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to acknowledge the 2021 uh, resolution by council led by Mayor Hawkins. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there were um, uh, colleagues around this table now who voted against it. And my hope is that they now see as we've moved through the pro program, the benefits to uh, members of our community. Now, this is about social wellbeing and we've heard that it really does make a difference to people's lives. Um, Accessibility isn't just about people in wheelchairs, certainly um, that is relevant. Um, and having had lived experience of making renovations of this kind, it is not inexpensive and there are rising costs in this area. Uh, so, so that should not come as a surprise. But as someone who's tried to navigate uh, a narrow doorway in a house uh, versus a wider doorway in the middle of the night with a wheelchair, um, it is excruciatingly difficult. Um, it's a mark of a council who looks after the most vulnerable members of our community. And we will be judged by that, uh, the way we look after, and I'm going to use the word older rather than elderly, <laughs> just because of the age range, um, the older members of our community who are more vulnerable. I think the staff for their considerable mahi in this regard uh, and the patience of the tenants as they've been moved out of their homes and then back in uh, to a warmer, drier, safer, accessible, more accessible home. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. I didn't mean to distract the item away to the um, income related rent subsidy but I have a feeling it just needs to be brought up every time we talk about this because it's an act of cynicism to completely cut us out when every other provider is providing a like, like um, similar kind of um, um, service for their community and basically Dunedin and Wellington have been cut out for political reasons and now apparently have been permanently cut out and I really find that to be offensive, to be honest. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I agree with Councillor O'Malley. I think, because um, it started last term, um, former Councillor um, Rachel Alder raised it, and there's clear benefits to all councils if we can get those subsidies for our tenants, because, you know, it can top up the, um, the, the money they get for an accommodation supplement, but um, at the moment, year after year, our um, community um, housing has lost money. And, of course, ratepayers start to say, well, what are you doing? You know, And that would help. We could charge market rent, but they would get extra money under the supplement. For these tenants not to be able to get it seems extremely unfair when other tenants in other ha private housing are able to get it. So, um, you know, we've stuck our neck out, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're the second largest um, community housing provider in the country, and we should be congratulated for that and get benefits for that, not penalised, because we are carrying the cost for it at the moment. And I think, you know, that would certainly mean, I think, but as Councillor O'Malley raised, and I think it's a very valid point, if we see the costs, we can then go to them with dollar value of what we're losing out on at the moment. So we can't say to be exact, but the money that we lose uh, often, most years, not every year, but most years on these um, apartments could, you know, maybe be saved if we if they got that accommodation supplement. Thank you. Councillor Fissel. I think Tenakwe, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I note that this report is just for um, voting, 
Um, so I just want to record thanks to Ms. Nilsson and her team uh, for the sterling work that um, that they're doing uh, in terms of uh, our future um, service to our residents, especially those who are vulnerable, uh, low income, and um, yeah, not necessarily having a high stake in, in, in the society going forward. And um, I know we're not meant to re-litigate um, decisions, but I just want to say this talk about making a loss or losing money is total to me, excuse me, a bullshit because oh, talk of market, market no, no, rents no. I apologise <laughs> talking about market rental rates and inflicting those on our vulnerable people is just not serving the needs of people and we've got to stop talking about the market knowing and setting and, and being um, the worshipping at the um, worshipping at the I notion that the market will set um, the needs and meet the needs. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think um, I think it's uh, um, entirely appropriate and laudable position that this council has taken in terms of the provision of this level of uh, of housing, uh, and indeed it's part of. Uh, the wider issues about accommodation supply uh, that we should be pleased that we're increasing. I'd make the observation that another part of that debate is the discussion about the reduction in the pool of other housing available because of operations such as um, short-term accommodation, which let's hope we can get to address uh, elsewhere. But in terms of the, the funding that has been earmarked for increasing the supply of the housing that we own and provide for appropriately qualified residents, I should think we should all be uh, only too pleased that that is in place and that the quality of what is being built is of such a high standard. I think those of us who visited the School Street redevelopment um, were appropriately, probably, probably, amazed, properly amazed at um, the sophistication of the um, the application of the passive house philosophy to small units of that kind, and long may that continue. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. I acknowledge this report is for noting, um, but I think it is exciting that there are some new units uh, on the plans. Um, but I also am concerned about um, ensuring that no matter which unit you live in, uh, you would have a healthy home. Uh, and I think that is the other part where I think we need to make sure that we do tick all those boxes in that aspect. Um, and I do want to... Um, look forward to a, a further discussion at the long-term plan around the funding of our uh, community housing. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I supported this, putting the $2 million, because um, we've gone off noting the plan, but I did support putting the money in, and I do support um, increasing the pool of um, homes available. We do have a... a still have a housing crisis and our housing action plan talked about having a home for everyone. Um, there's been a lot of coverage of homeless people in the um, in the Otago Daily Times as well and I don't know if this will go a huge way towards um, giving them any help but at least we are starting to um, increase our number of, of homes which we haven't done for a long time. Um, but we still need to look at what we're going to do about homelessness in the city. I think we all saw there was a big fire in the, um, in the weekend and are all relieved to read that nobody actually died. So we do need to um, keep focus on providing homes for people and providing safe homes for people. So, uh, in replying to this, uh, I'd like to draw our attention to the very long history that the DCC has had in supplying homes for the elder, the older members of our community uh, who are, you know, quite vulnerable and need somewhere to live. And so uh, we have done that and. Uh, in the last few years, we extended the 
policy to take into account um, other people without the same age needs, but uh, other areas of concern and other areas of vulnerability. So I think that's very laudable. I think it's very important so that we're building homes with universal design, and I would exhort, I would exhort any uh, builder of a home, uh, be it a developer or a, a purchaser or a speculative builder, to build those wide doorways in particular because uh, many, many people in our community and possibly most of the people in this room will end up in a wheelchair at some stage, whether it's uh, as a result of an accident or uh, getting uh, aged. Hopefully so, you, you, need, uh, you need to have um, the use of a wheelchair, albeit properly. So it's a very helpful thing and uh, in any home to be able to uh, have accessibility and have those principles of universal design uh, in the home at very little cost, as we have heard. And um, with the change of government, it might be that there is a levelling of the playing field as far as the subsidies for uh, income-related rents go. So uh, that could be helpful to us, and I think um, across the board it would be uh, uh, it would help the growth of housing for our community right throughout the country, uh, but also in Dunedin. And so uh, one other thing that did occur to me, uh, you know, listening to the uh, food resilience uh, discussion at the beginning of this meeting. So one of the things that is a hangover from uh, England was that there were areas of ground in various communities that were marked out as allotments. Because we do have a farmer's market and a lot more interest in homegrown vegetables and grown uh, food, uh, the idea of allotments as part of um, the, our community houses or even as part of various communities around might be something to uh, encourage people to get out and grow things. And uh, in particular, I was inspired, you know, the thought came to me one time in Germany, uh, in quite a significant suburb, I noticed there's some just over the back of a, um, of a railway line that was all divided up into little plots. And there were loads of, you know, they, all of them were in gardens with a little shed at the end. So they're clearly allotments uh, that seem to me be, to be getting a lot of use. And um, it was not, not ideal land for putting a house on, but it was ideal for growing a garden. So I was surprised to see that in Germany. I'd heard all about it in the UK. But uh, it was great to see that so well used and they had a summer house. I'm sure someone here could provide a better translation to that, but what they called a summer house and um, they were very well used. So that could be something else to uh, develop or help us grow uh, more community food resilience. So anyway, uh, on that note, I'd like to... Uh, Move. I would like to put the motion that Council notes the um, community uh, community housing program update. Well, uh, and I, I did have a second earlier. So, all those in favour, say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Moving on to item number ten, the Edgar Centre update report. So, Mr. West and Ms. Nelson, back to the table. Do you have any prefacing comments? But we do have questions. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just have a few questions. So I was wondering, we, the Council gives a 250000 operating grant, and I wonder if that has changed over the years, or has it just been at two fifty forever? No, it has changed, the Councillor. It used to be a property arrangement grant, so you might be aware that we've changed some of these in the past where we used to have a money go round effectively. That's why they don't pay a, uh, any rental on the lease now. So that amount used to be, and I'm looking at uh, parts, much higher than that. And then a, a, a portion of it came back to council for the lease costs. So I'm just looking at how it's run, and I looked on their website and could, I could find that the DCC, um, do we get to put on three trustees? I can't sort of recall that coming to council. So how does that work and how does the reporting work? 
So the trust deed, I looked at it on Friday actually, just in preparation. Um, we appoint three trustees and in my time here I think there's been a couple of appointments since in the last six years from memory. So I'm just wondering about the reporting because um, I don't know if this is, a, we've heard a little bit about the Eco Centre in the state that it's in, but I'm just wondering whether it's a surprise to come to council or whether the uh, annual reports that come to council and talk about how the grant was used, what their finances look like, um, and the state of the building and any issues? I, I don't recall a report that's come through to council in recent times. Um, the the grant um, the money that comes in is a parks grant and I know it's being you know that that's all part of the grants review that's being looked at uh, for by council for the ten year plan. What I would say, remember, we still own the building, and so the trust manage the activities that happen in the building. So it's slightly different. Our responsibility still is for the building, and um, Anna and the team have reported back semi regularly on the structure. <coughs> Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering whether there was a service level agreement or whether the people that the council appoints to be trustees have a, a method of reporting back to council. I will check. I think they do send a letter at the end of each year just saying, uh, but at, at a high level, I'll, but I'll find out for you. Um, my next question is just around the purpose of the... The regional spaces and places planned by Sport New Zealand. I see they're doing that work, and I just wonder what the purpose of the work is, and whether at the end there might be any government funds available to help with um, the Eco Centre. Is there is that a possibility of Sport New Zealand putting some money in? I don't think that's something we can answer. I'm looking over at Mr. McLean because it's parks, um, but I I, I, mean, I don't know the answer to that, Councillor. Um, I guess there's there is a, po a possibility if there is a fund. But it's uh, it's probably self-explanatory. That regional study is to look at um, facilities across the region rather than just within the city to see what, what sort of facilities we provide as a region. So, so that's, that's work that um, Sport New Zealand are doing and that the purpose is just information, not necessarily um, looking at gap analysis or anything like that? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, so they will be looking at uh, a range of things. Um, Mr West mentioned the facilities at a regional level. Um, that'll include re what they consider regionally important um, so that there's not duplication of large infrastructure. But they're also looking at trends in sport over time and, and predicting what uh, that might look like over the next sort of 20 to 30 years so that um, councils, um, among others, can invest in... Um, infrastructure that will be fit for purpose into the future. So we're doing work on our play spaces and all of that, so is our work is it as our work and timing aligned with the work that Sport New Zealand are doing? Uh, yes, so we'll be, uh, we'll wait for that um, regional plan to come out and then we will hold the pen on develop, using that data and develop a, essentially a sub-regional uh, plan for Dunedin. And how does that align with our long-term plan? Just the, obviously there's investment decisions that we would have to be making and I'm just wondering how the timing aligns. Uh, it's my understanding that they won't be finished that work until uh, next, towards the end of next calendar year. Thank you. And that goes in some way to my opening comments about we're providing this information for councillors so you, you know where we are. Um, because it's certain that you will get um, requests for further funding, it would seem to me. But this is just to help you start to think about that in a broader context. So having an awareness that the um, Sport Otago are doing their plan would actually really help us and when people come to us for decisions about investment, because there are a lot. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so I have councillors, councillors uh, Walker, Gilbert, O'Malley, Deputy Mayor Lucas and Wiley, just to let you know, Councillor Walker. Easy day for me, Councillor Barker stole my question again. Very good. Councillor Gilbert. You, you did promise earlier on not to ask any unless they were on cycling, so just pointing out. Um, 
points number five and twenty six had me slightly um, frazzled. And I'm trying to think of a way of wording this that isn't inflammatory in any way, shape or form, and I'm failing to do so. So, uh, you're talking about differential settlement and tidal movements causing the three buildings to shift and sink in different ways and at different rates. If that was happening to my house, I would be panicking at this point. Is there any reason that we should be panicking about the state of the rest of the building, aside from the roof leaks? No, I wouldn't be panicking. It's not at all dangerous, um, and it has been happening since 1978 when it was built. So it's very slow. Very good. Councillor Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think my question really goes down to what didn't, did, weren't we doing our own facilities review as well? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, so we did. We did a, a review and it was essentially a stock take, and then that information is feeding into uh, Sport Otago's regional stock take. And so when that all comes out, I'm looking at the points above about the roof replacement and other such things. Are we going to be going to a point where we will have to make a decision on how much more money you would put into this? And, and I'm, I'm on the ice stadium board as well, and it's not quite the same, but it's got some similar issues. Is that the next round of iterations after this? Potentially. There are a range of things, right? Some might be, because we know we've got a range of ageing assets, and um, competing priorities for where we spend our money. And it might be, and I've, this is just an example, we decide with the Edgar Centre that we just patch it for the next 30 years because it's not going to get appreciably worse um, while we do other things. Alternatively, you might decide, once we do that priority work, that the Edgar Centre then becomes a priority. But, yeah, all of those decisions have to happen. Lining up everything at the same time is really, really challenging. Is the driver the Sport Otago in terms of the, the timing of this, is the New Zealand, Sport New Zealand and, and the Sport Otago work, is that the, will that be the, the piece of work that gives us our understanding? Yes, yeah, certainly for, uh, for, for that larger infrastructure um, it will be, because they're big investments. There will also be city-wide considerations that we're going to have to think about as we start to do future development strategy and all of those things when we think about the kind of resources we want to have in place over time and where. And so there, and there's other things that feed into considerations around the Edgar Centre. Very good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you. So at the moment there's no um, funding in the long-term plan for Eager Centre work? There's no substantial capital funding. We do have an amount of operational funding in there to continue and up the ante, if you like, on the repairs that we're doing and some minor improvements to the ventilation to get some more airflow through it. So in terms of, I mean, you list in here about repairing the roof um, and ballpark is 16 to 18 million. Have you looked, and I mean at least to um, what the Chief was saying, have you looked at overall, if you repair the roof, does that um, that investment prolong the use of the building or is that just almost like a sticking plaster on onto the building? It would prolong the use of the building. Um, it would improve the facility's ability to have games and not suffer from leaks and condensation. But the reality is it's still moving we will continue to see the results of that movement all across the facility. And I guess leading on to the, um, looking at the whole facilities review, I mean, bearing in mind the Eager Centre has 21 courts which are heavily utilised and already there's huge demand for courts across the city. Um, and if you look, if you talk in before about trends in sport, if we look, talk about basketball and volleyball, are obviously two sports that are growing and in need of court space and the, the school gyms are already highly utilised. Are we expecting that really what's going to come forward is looking for more court space? Uh, thanks, Councillor. Uh, I, I would imagine so, yes. Right, thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, a question regarding the condensation, and I read it in here, and I've just been quickly trying to find the right um, paragraph, was the roof repairs have actually increased the issues of condensation? 
and the, and the filling up the natural ventilation? <coughs> Yes, over those particular A-grade courts, we've improved the leaks, um, but we are now getting more condensation on the A-grade courts. Okay, um, and just um, I note the, the quality of the trustees you have on the um, uh, on that trust and that oversee this for us uh, and the appointees. Um, so I take it um, they are comfortable with where it's at at the moment. Uh, and I'm thinking of the health and safety risk. I couldn't speak on behalf of the board. Have they raised it um, in their documentation to council? All I'd say, councillor, is um, I don't know whether they've raised it in their reporting through to council. It's certainly something that the, the um, management of the, the centre and some of the codes that use it have raised with um, Anna and her team uh, and hence the work that they've been trying to do to offset that. Um, and and I, all I would say is that um, the relationship between the board and the users are, and the management of the, the Edgar Centre is pretty good. So the, rel the conversations that occur between th those people and, and these two are, are pretty good. Um. Perfect. Now, the another question I've got is the ability to raise funds by the, uh, the Edgar Centre Trust, um, and are they able to get funds from Otago Community Trust, lotteries, Class 4 gambling, etc.? The Building Envelopes Council's responsibility, Council. So if they were to raise funds, they could only raise it for their interior minor maintenance. If that's what you're talking about, we're responsible for the repairs. So not for the, anything relating to the building itself. I thought more FM Arena, when that work was done, they received money from Otago Community Trust. Am I incorrect? In they did, but that probably was before the current arrangements were in place. Okay. That was when it was being established, right? That was in the history. Okay. So. Yeah, a question's um, just come to mind. I know that, again, this is a, a, a report for noting uh, from Councillor Lucas's question. And I'm just trying to get a cognition of, I mean, I, I guess available courts are a bit like roading. I mean, they're largely not used, and there's peak times when they're clogged. Is that similar with the courts at the Edgar Centre? And how difficult is it to, to, I guess, manipulate demand to spread that across empty times? Um, thanks, Councillor. Uh, the, the challenge um, uh, lies in people's availability. Um, so sort of during school time and, and work time, um, the courts are pretty quiet at the Edgar Centre. Um, but then after that, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's the, the facilities there, um, but it's challenging to get people um, that work and go to school to um, be able to go there during the day. So it's something, I mean, I'm just thinking across, because this won't be unique to us, it'll be a problem across the world, and I'm just wondering that th if there are examples of, other than, of course, just letting old DCC staff not work during the day. I mean, it's, it, I'm sure it's a problem that's been addressed elsewhere, and I'm interested to know if there's been, look, you know, looked at solutions or possibilities, or beyond the obvious one you've just stated. Yeah, thanks. And um, we, we work pretty closely with the, uh, the management team at the Edgar Centre to try and work out how we can, how they can best utilise um, and get the the highest sort of throughput. But yeah, uh, just a question, just a technical question about the roof, because that's um, you know quite a significant issue. Have we investigated flexible waterproofing uh, material for the roof? You know because of the the fixings for the roof are an area where things move, and so flexible material might be able to seal up. The leak, uh, but still allow for movement, and subsequent to that, have we investigated spraying the inside of the roof with an insulation material, which would then um, work to prevent condensation on the inside, and hopefully be cost effective. But you know, whether such things are available in New Zealand from a spray from a spray gun or not. <coughs> 
yeah. We've had some initial discussions around the idea of a spray-on flexi epoxy, if you like, on the top of the roof, and we've had some in initial discussions around how we could provide a thermal barrier, um, whether it's spraying or we put a drop ceiling in. We're just early on in the piece, and any solution costs considerably because of the size of the thing. Mm. Very good. <laughs> Are there any further questions? It appears not. Thank you very much, team. Uh, that being the case, I'd like to um, I'd like to move uh, the motion that we note the Edgar Centre report. Do I have a seconder for that, Councillor Fiso? Um, and in speaking to this, this is quite an important. I'd just like to note that there's a very important facility for Dunedin because it is so well used. It's been quite a phenomenal asset. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it does come with its issues. But uh, I think it's certainly made a big difference to sport in Dunedin, the ability to be able to play in all weathers and to schedule games without um, constant weather cancellation. So and it's also used for a range of other uh, events, you know, such as car shows and trade shows and um, various types of community events, large community events. So I think it's getting really well used, so I think it's very important that we do retain its, uh, retain this facility. Does anyone else like to speak to the report? Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you. Um, I spend obviously a huge amount of time at the Eager Centre and I know the issues very well and in answer to Councillor Wiley's concern about health and safety, management are very good about moving games off courts, but it does give Dunedin a very bad reputation. I'm aware of national basketball tournaments having to finish early because of the leaking roof and not being able to um, find court space to be able to finish tournaments and so you know there is a reputational risk that con you know if, it, if constantly um, having leaking roofs um, and it is even though it's um, all weather it is uh, unbelievably cold my kids call the arena the fridge and the main part of the egg centre the freezer because it is so cold um, and it is um, an answer to Councillor Walker's comment about usage I mean from 3 30 I would say every weekday till 10 o'clock at night and weekends it's fully packed and you know there are trainings there at seven o'clock in the morning before school a lot of school teams and the Nuggets for example train there so I mean the usage is high um, and even during the day there's a lot of you know social tennis and things that are played um, and I guess the concern is the huge cost to um, as I said um, effectively a, a sticking plaster for the for the roof um, but something obviously will, needs to be done at some point um, and it's another item that we're going to have to consider and I am very aware that in a relatively short period of time we're going to be asked to be you know help fund another facility because there is the demand the court demand is so high and every school gym um, is very well utilized um, because teams want to train and practice and they can't you know there's not even enough Edgar center space for um, sports teams to um, train and so most schools I would say would have um, teams that are not you know not involved whether it be you know a women's netball team men's basketball team are training in their facilities so it's I guess I'm just signaling that um, it's another issue that we're going to have to to grapple with because it is so well utilized um, I'm sure many of you have tried to find a car park there on a Saturday um, and gone round and round and I think there's something like 400 spaces it's just it's it's that well utilized so um, it's another hard decision for us thank you Councillor Wiley um, yeah, thank you. I agree with all what uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Lucas said. Um, the key thing is the Edgar Centre is an asset for the city, and I think that's something we do have to acknowledge. Yeah, it is probably the busiest place to be at four o'clock um, many afternoons, and um, yeah, it makes it quite challenging at times uh, driving up and down Portsmouth Drive. But it is great to see a facility so well used. Um, Blair and his team at the Edgar Centre do an amazing job in how they manage what they've got there and actually how they do as much as they can flexibility wise to cope with the issues that they face. I also um, want to acknowledge the work the trustees do because they are a very effective board uh, of management there and how they uh, oversee the operations on behalf of the people of Dunedin and for the um, uh, council. It is uh, frustrating when you look on Sport New Zealand website and you see that actually there is no funding available for us um, on that basis. But um, 
give you an idea, I know many of the facilities in Auckland were um, heavily affected by the anniversary <laughs> weekend storms uh, and they've struggled dramatically this year. I know pre-COVID that uh, they were 52 badminton courts short in Auckland and they were busy trying to find money uh, to fund those developments. So we do have an asset in this city, we do have to maintain it, we do have to look after it. And I'll just go back to, um, in the executive summary, paragraph 5, the key wording there for me, the Edgar Centre is a dynamic building. And um, it can, that word dynamic can be used in many ways. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Lucas uh, covered the value of the facility uh, extremely well and the challenges before us, so I'm not going to go over that again. But what I do want to do is just take a moment to acknowledge Lady Jan Edgar. Um, Jan was a netball coach. We were on the same staff uh, at St Hilda's Collegiate. I was the manager of the boarding hostel. Many of my girls, my boarders, played netball. Jan was a passionate coach of netball and really wanted to see an indoor facility for her girls who played netball and persuaded her husband uh, to um, to be part of this facility, gifting this facility. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Jan uh, in that, uh, the origins of this facility. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I you all know I love a good statistic. Um, so the Eager Centre is not only used for sport, it's also used for things like cruise meetings. We went to a cruise meeting within the last couple of weeks and a lot of ethnic community celebrations. I think many councillors have been there for that. So it's not just the sport, it's a, a well-used um, community asset. And we have apparently, according to our ROS survey, 49% of people visited the Edgar Centre in the last 12 months. So it is a hugely used um, community asset. And there was 78% satisfaction and they obviously went in the fridge and the freezer. It's very lovely and warm in the meeting room, I might add. Um, the reasons I asked the question about Sport New Zealand was actually to try and explore whether there was any government money um, to, to, to go into this facility because there is a huge amount of money um, and also just about establishing the demand for sport because we all talk about what is the demand, but it's good to have, um, be good to get those statistics as well. And also because we are going to have a lot of competing priorities for the long-term plan funding and if we go on the wall, we see gymnastics, people want to gymnastics. I think table tennis has turned up on the wall as well. So we really do need that information to um, help our decisions. And then I think we're also going to be looking at the work of South Dunedin Futures. When we talk about it being a dynamic building, <laughs> there's a lot of water around because I drive up and down Portsmouth Drive and it's concerning. So I think that we will have to talk about not just whether we put the band-aid on with the roof on, but actually maybe we need a new facility there in 50 years' time. So when we're thinking about band-aiding, we also need to think about what does the future of South Dunedin look like and, and draw that work in. So it's um, I really appreciate getting the update report so that does something to, um, to bank when we come into making our decisions for the long-term plan. Um, it's going to be challenging. Yes, indeed, I think that's it. And I think there's uh, nothing further for me to say, so in which case I'll put the motion that we note the Edgar Centre update report. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Come back. See, I did a, a call for a second earlier. Yes. <laughs> so uh, moving on to the Aquatic Network Co-Investment Update, item number 11. Page 72 in the agenda. Are there questions of the report? Starting with Councillor Fisa. Um, I'm, um, my question is about uh, point 21 um, on page 75, and it's about the the 76, I think, if my maths is right, 76,000 um, in, in DCC funding for operational and technical advice. Um, so that's not, that's not the, anything to do with um, recent asset condition as assessments for school pools. Kia Councillor, thank you. Um, no, that's, uh, that's ongoing funding that's been around for quite a while. Um, so 
the school uh, point twenty five schools spoken to did not have recent asset condition assessments um, for their pools, and would they be asking the DCC uh, to assist them with that funding? That mahi. Uh, so that's something that um, we haven't gone into in great detail. So that would be part of the if, if we're to take a networked approach. That those would be some of the things that we would have to um, agree and negotiate with with the schools. So, um, but we would need detailed asset condition assessment reports. Um, but just who gets those and how they're, f they're funded is it will come out. And one last question, um, given the the. Um the previous uh, report that we had on used universal design principles, well, are, are the current swimming pools at schools um, accessible for children with disabilities? Uh, thanks, councillors. Some of them aren't. Um, some of them are. Some of them have got some uh, really good facilities, um, but we know that some of them are not. So those are the things that we would have to consider um, if we were to invest in that network. Okay. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, Mr McLean, uh, two questions. The first one around the choice of the hubs. I note that there's not, uh, you haven't chosen outer areas in that list of hubs, um, and in particular in the following list, which is further down the page at 21, uh, Strathtyre is in there, Big Rock Primary School and Portobello School. And I'm just wondering how your choice of hub fits with the zero carbon plan and that there's quite a lot of distance to travel for those schools if they're coming into um, bigger pools where there's more maintenance and if those pools, if we lose those pools, uh, there's a lot of travelling involved. Thank you councillor. Um, certainly sustainability would uh, have to be front of mind um, with any, any investment. Um, the conversations we had with some of the schools, um, they did talk about the cost implications of potentially attending a, a hub pool. Um, it was certainly more appealing to those within walking distance, because um, buses are expensive for schools. So, um, but those are all of the things that we'll think about. And secondly, um, can I just clarify in point 23, the funding grant, Am I to understand that our grant was not uplifted, wasn't needed in the end, is that correct? Uh, it, it wasn't uplifted, there was some um, project logistics, um, it took some time to get a project manager and scope the project up fully. But, but our grant wasn't needed because it was fully funded, is that right? No. Not quite, um, the, the school would have liked the grant but the council resolution was very clear it needed to be uplifted within a certain time frame, it wasn't. Councillor Walker. Um, oops, gosh, no, you knocked myself out. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, two questions, I think. Um, reading this, obviously, I imagine the Wellington experience was pretty useful reading, um, which alluded to the fact that it was, it pointed out that schools just are struggling, I guess, with capacity and the complexity of, of, of these projects. Can you, I mean, is that your feeling? And in Dunedin as well, that, that would that would translate here. Uh, thanks, Councillor. I think the um, the DNI uh, example was um, one of those. It's the, these things are really complex, complex facilities and complex construction things. So they are some of the things that we would discuss um, in a networked approach, um, as p potentially assisting with that sort of thing, or certainly learning from Wellington, um, making them well aware that there are. Some things take time, like consents and project management is a, a, an additional cost on the capital costs. So, yeah. And um, just locationally, Carisbrook School would be ideal, and I think the report noted that they didn't respond despite the fact they get a grant from us. Was that still is that still the case that they haven't fed into this? Uh, yeah, they w they didn't respond to uh, initial requests, but um, we don't know why. I mean, schools are busy, so. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Um, in respect of that question about Carisbrook, I mean, I, I'm aware of the fact that there are a large number of young people in that area who've never even been to the beach, um, which raises questions about 
their social mobility and so on. Are you planning to get back to Carisbrook School given the location and the the demography of the area and talk to them about whatever their concerns might be? Thanks, Councillor. Uh, yes, certainly. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep engage with, engaging with them. And further to that, I mean, I, I've seen a few of the pools uh, and I'm assuming because most of them were built at the same time, uh, they are of a similar design with a raised concrete tank which was ideal for teachers saving people or teaching them to swim without having to get their, get their togs on. Um, but equally the pools are all of an age. Is that a fair comment? And there must be serious questions about the wider infrastructure and filtration and the rest of it. Yes, yeah, certainly, and that's what the condition assessment reports would be um, pretty critical for that. So the, the newest pool uh, is 47 years old, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Thank you. Um, on 21, where you talk about the pools that we give um, operational funding to, is that historical, for example, like Fairfield Pools not on the Otago Boys? I mean, that's just off the top of my head. Like, why do we not support all of the pools with funding and then and the varying amounts? Uh, thanks, Councillor. I'm not sure of the origin of some of these um, grants, decisions. Um, some of them go back quite quite a long time, so um, it may be some of those schools haven't requested ongoing annual funding, but I, I can't answer that. And Mr McLean, I think there was a previous report that detailed what funding we gave or didn't give to all the pools, and, I, and that showed that, but we have no answers. Was that the last report? Yes, that was the February Aquatic Re Network Review. In your discussions with um, schools, have they brought up health and safety? I've been in communication with the Rector of Otago Boys and asking him, you know, what's been going on with their pool. And he said one of the things that they're concerned about is, um, as he says here, um, that, that for them, that their parking's terrible, um, the changing rooms, while better, are not easily him, her, um, and they are concerned about health and safety for the pool, you know, that the school would be responsible for health and safety, say, if it was open during the weekends or whatever. Have other schools raised those kind of issues? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so when we did the network review, um, that's the feedback we had from um, some of the principals that have schools that uh, operate pools. Um, and that was more in response to uh, the, the idea of if, if council were to invest, could the community get, get greater use? And I think um, for some of them it was a, a, almost a bridge too far, um, just in terms of that liability and um, things go on in pools. That some schools might not want to deal with, so. Okay. Uh, just a question about uh, Mornington School. It's the, they've got the largest amount of grant, but it's not a hub. It, is it not servicing any other schools? I, I couldn't tell you that, Mr Mayor, off the top of my head, but I can find that out for you. Right. Yep. It just seems unusual, and you know, then there's a couple that, as uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas pointed out, that aren't getting any grant money. Anyway. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Very good. Thank you very much. So, uh, that being the case, I'll move that Council notes the Aquatic Network Co-Investment Update Report. Seconder, Councillor Mayhem. Do we have any speakers? Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to remind colleagues of our absolutely appalling drowning statistics which were 94 in 2020 down to 69 to date this year 85% um, male 55 plus males uh, in the highest risk and there was a time in that particular generation where and I have memory of this where people didn't know how to swim and I think it would be uh, absolutely appalling if we didn't support um, the pools uh, in some way or other which we are uh, and ensure every child gets the opportunity to learn how to swim and have access to that opportunity. Uh, and so I just want to acknowledge the work of staff and the concerns of the community, uh, both the maintenance of school pools, which is, is difficult and it's an ageing facility, uh, and I think this work is particularly important in terms of planning for the future. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, thank you. Um, I would just like to remind 
colleagues that um, school pools that are owned by the Ministry of Education that for schools to be able to upgrade them it comes out of their five yearly property budget and so they have to make a choice of whether they're going to spend their money upgrading their pool or upgrading other facilities so it is a very hard decision you know they have to balance that and I can see that potentially we could have another we could have a steady succession of schools coming to us wanting assistance to help fund their pools if we you know there it's a hard thing if we're going to go and look at the network are we opening a can of worms in terms of then the funding that may be at our doorstep as well so I'm just highlighting that thank you yes councillor Hulan Yes, I agree, and I've raised this before, um, and I know it's touched on in here um, a bit, but is that once again, and we had, I've shared this story before, but I think it's relevant, we had at our little school where the kids were for primary school, an older um, building on there, we had major issues with funding for that. Same goes for pools. And, I mean, once again, the Ministry of Education in my opinion, doesn't seem to be stepping up enough money to fund these. And a lot of them have got run down and the schools are left in a very awkward position. So I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, maybe we should send a letter to the Ministry of Education again or or just saying, um, please, you know, to remind them that they do have a, a responsibility to fund some of these polls or all of them would be good. Okay, thank you. And on that note, I'll um, put the motion. All those in favour that we uh, note the report, say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 12, the Zero Carbon Alliance Work Program Update. We have Ms Reynolds and Ms Moran to the, to the table. Thank you. Any preface and comments? No? Questions, councillors? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have a question and a concern about the membership of the um, collaboration group. I don't know who's going to be able to answer this because it was it looks like it was set up in such a way that it devolved to staff representation rather than governance representation. Would that be correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's what's set out in the MOU, correct. Um, how many times have they met in the last year? It says in their MOU that they're supposed to meet twice yearly. Yes, that's correct. I believe there's been two meetings. Okay, so I, I note that they decided at this time not to invite anyone else. Um, if council were to move that we would like to the that we would like the um, to in the Zero Carbon Alliance to invite Business South to join the Zero Carbon Action Group. Uh, I guess this is directed at the CEO. Is that a possibility for us to do that? Because we seem to have no mechanism otherwise. Uh, based on the MOU, uh, I believe it would need to be unanimously agreed to by all parties um, because it is a, col a collaborative process. Um, I think Business South would meet the criteria in the MOU um, of the type of organisation that could be added. So how does how does council direct the representatives, which are council staff, to um, to, to to make this decision? Well, there's a a, govern a council governance group that is. Um, in the process of being formed, isn't there as well over zero, the zero carbon work plan? So there's a different layer. That this is the operate. Op, I can't even say that word. This is how we do the stuff. Um, and the, well, I'm happy to um, have a chat with the staff involved and get them to put it on the agenda to discuss um, additional membership because Business South does seem sensible now that the um, alliance is up and running. But it needed to get up and running first. Um, so. um, yeah, we can certainly look into it. Um, but based on the MOU, we would need all the other parties to also be agreeable to that. 
So with the MOU, is that, is that agreeing at a staff level or is that agreeing at a governance level? Would it have to go back to all of the governance entities to make a decision? I believe it wouldn't need to go to the governance level. Um, I think that the collaboration group would be the ones that would need to decide that. If you give us... A I'll review the MOU quickly and tell you what it says. I just need to check what I haven't looked with that question in mind when I read it. Yeah, it looks to be overly complex and we've devolved decision making, which is um, a little concerning. Is it, will that be addressed in the zero carbon governance group that we have decided or we're we looking at having? Well, I, um, once you've got the governance group, you'll be able to look at what areas you want to have want to govern. It might be that you ask for the MOU to be reviewed as part of that. Okay. So in the meantime, we'll, Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the report and the work. Uh, two questions. First one, um, feel free not to answer if it's commercially sensitive, but the report alludes to the fact that there's a preferred provider now identified for the car share. Are you in a position to say when that'll start and who it is? Uh, we're not in a position to publicly comment um, based on the terms of the MOU with them. Um, we would need to, before public comment, we'd need to discuss that with them, yep. Cool, thank you. I suspected that. The second part is the report talks about um, the, the fact that the DCC is progressing um, a project and improving um, access to e-bikes and bikes collaboratively with the um, Zero Carbon Alliance members. Uh, as part of our Zero Carbon 2030 work. Um, can you just expand a wee bit on that and what it involves? Um, that's still in quite early stages. Um, so I think the idea is to follow a similar process that we took for car share. So first is looking, doing a bit of a scan at what solutions there are out there um, across the motu and then um, working to refine possible options through that. Um, presumably looking at best practice in other jurisdictions abroad? Yes, that would be part of it too. If I could have, in, I think the MOU Councillor Barker is ambiguous when it comes to the, in 13.2 um, of the MOU talks about how a new party may be admitted, talks about a unanimous agreement um, of the Zero Carbon Alliance Collaboration Group but it also says may be admitted on the invitation of the DCC. I don't know if the DCC in that context is the Office of Machinery or Council, and I would need to consider that. Yeah, it is, yeah the, the wording is not entirely clear. Okay. Are you finished, Councillor Walker? Are you okay there? Uh, Councillor Hulahan? Thank you. Um, from these meetings, do we, is there a sister, a type of process where council will get a report from those or they want to keep it private? What, how does that work? Sorry, what meetings are you referring to? Yeah, the, the zero, um, the, like the, the group that meets, um, it's been, what, what it's what the um, So where it's got three, the three public sector, the, the two local authorities, and that the, they've been meeting twice a year. So do we, does, is there any follow on for reports from those meetings or are they all confidential? What, like? It's our intention to report like this um, every six months um, through that, following that process, yes. Any other questions? So, have the group? So, given this is perhaps a follow-on from a report from that, is the uh, um, do the, the organisations that are involved in this, i.e., Pokanga, the university, the all of those, are there any concerns from those groups on meeting their targets? And if there are, what are they? And do they think you know? It, uh, is can they see any? Way have they talked about ways forward? And um, I don't think I'm in a position to answer that on behalf of the other organisations, unfortunately. But 
um, what I would say is that the group, like the collaboration has been really useful for all parties in progressing their own internal and also city emissions reduction projects and also sharing best practice. So, oh, so, oh. As well, Councillor, the report um, that in your papers does give an update on the positions of each of the partners, so it says where they're at as, as best we can. So Florence probably oh, can't comment further than that. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, in that case, I'll now uh, put the motion that we note this report. So we note the zero carbon uh, report. Uh, sorry, and who, who would like to speak to that now? Because we've already oh, had did a you second. Seconded? Oh, nope. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a good deep dive down into this because I was really concerned about the governance versus the operational and, and, and how that was working when I read through the, um, the memorandum of understanding, very concerned that if we wanted another member that this goes down to an operational level to decide and, the, and in the notes it says that they've decided that they didn't want another member um, for the time being and I see that Business South is a absolute... We need them. It represents um, more than 1,400 members throughout Otago South, and and they have got a. They're working. They're committed to practicing sustainably and are working to attaining a carbon positive status. And we need city leaders to actually also be part of this group. Um, they're very influential as well, and they are partners in our economic development strategy. So that's why I asked, would we have to move something as council to get them in? Because it seems like an overly complex project. But what um, what makes me, I guess, happy is that we have already covered um, in our forward work program that we've got a zero carbon governance um, paper coming to council. So hopefully we'll remember that this got a little bit tricky and uh, sorted out next month. Thank you. Good. Are there any other speakers? Okay, in which case I'll put the motion. All those in favour, the council notes the zero carbon alliance work program. Update, say aye. Against, carried. Now, um, we've possibly got time to squeeze one in. We've got. Uh, this is credit system. Yes, I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> so, the um, the there is something that I think is reasonably straightforward, Councillor O'Malley, the uh, appointment of people to the uh, run down the list. Right, okay, so we'll do that. But, okay, in which case, I believe lunch is here. So I'd like to move that we adjourn for lunch, seconded Councillor um, Lafiso, and further to that, at 1 o'clock, we'll be having a briefing. So we'll be late back from lunch. We won't get back till 2 o'clock. So we have Mr. Maudsley, Ms. Lunas, is that her pronunciation? Lunas, very good. And Mr. Ward, you happy with Ward pronunciation? <laughs> Ward, <laughs> got a check. Um, thank you. And uh, any questions in advance? Uh, any comments in advance? Uh, no? Kia ora, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to um, <clears throat> just to describe the intent of the paper, the uh, so the report. The re report describes the aspirations of the Ministry for the Environment mm -hmm. in exploring the biodiversity credit system, and the proposed submission um, s seeks clarification regarding the implementation of the credit system, and uh, making sure that it is relevant to the uh, Otaputi Dunedin region. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And there were some uh, interesting considerations there, I thought. Do we have any questions about the report? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question about, um, on page 113, it says there are implications for LTP and levels of service. 
I, does that refer to financial implications that may be, uh, that may happen if this went through and that we would need extra staffing and resources to manage it? Is that where that comes from? Page 113, it's on, under the LTP Annual Plan Financial Strategy, Infrastructure Strategy, there are implications for LTP slash levels of service. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I think we were just signalling, si signalling uh, as we don't know the, the implementation um, uh, aspects, it was just a note there to be just to be broad in its commentary. So would that refer maybe to paragraph 21 where it says the administrative and logistical burdens on territorial authorities are clearly outlined in the discussion document, um, blah, 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 but their capacity to provide resources and support may vary. Does that, does that relate to that? In a nutshell, yes, thank you. My comment would be it should say, I, I suspect there are possibly implica implications that would depend on the, um, what was resolved. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you. Do we have any idea, oh by the way, thank you for the work, this is fascinating, first I'd heard of it, it appears to be quite complex. Do we have any indication of how um, the various and wonderful environmental groups around our city who work in the biodiversity area, how they have responded to this initiative and do they, are they even aware of it? Thank you. Um, not, not to my knowledge. I'm not sure, and it's, again, it's, it's not quite clear within the discussion document how that would impact the work that they're currently doing. I've certainly had a lot of questions recently around funding going forward um, from them, so I think it was a real concern. Uh, and do we have any indication of how Mana Whenua have responded to this at this point? Not at this point. Councillor Bitsa Pope. Um, thank you. Um, aside from your concerns about what is asked for in the submission in terms of detail and the operationalisation of this, it seemed to me when reading it that it would potentially align very well with the biodiversity activities of both the Runaka or the Yellow Eyed Penguin Trust or the Otago Peninsula Trust and on it goes. Is that your feeling? Yes, I think a biodiversity credit system in a whole has the potential to align very well um, with all of those different things and DCC strategies too. At this point of time, the discussion document doesn't give us enough of that information to um, kind of know for sure how that would look in practice. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, not the first time. Um, thank you. This follows on slightly from Councillor Benson Pope's question and um, and speaks, and I think you make it clear in the submission, actually, and thanks for the great work, that this discussion document, and just and the question is, am I, is this my correct analysis, that the discussion document is full of unanswered un questions, ambiguities, points to be answered, lack of detail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in terms of, for me, when I read it, was there was too many unanswered questions. Yes, yeah, that was my understanding as well. It's it's got a lot of ideas around how a biodiversity credit system could look in New Zealand, um, but there's many options and there's no um, path that is has been taken yet. I, I agree and, and I'd never get you to ask her, a, ask her answer a higher level political question but we open today by talking about a lot of what we're doing today will be affected by the new government and of the stuff I've read this is probably the first one on the chopping block. You don't have to answer. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, I had the same question as Councillor Barker in terms of how the scheme would be administered. So, it, the button, sorry. The logical way, from our point of view, would be administered along the same lines we do with the biodiversity grants. Is that how we you would think that? It it's not clear within this document how it would be if it would be run like that. I, the biodiversity 
grants are in terms of money a lot smaller in project scope and yeah. And my my other question um, refers to the last bullet point on page 107. Um, when you talk about um, retrospective work, and obviously not just from the Runaka, but obviously from other organisations, but you don't talk about that in your submission in terms of whether retrospective work would be captured. Is that something that should be included, or, you, or does it say that in the discussion document clearly that it's not? It doesn't say either it can be included within and added. So should that be something that we highlight in our submission about, especially significant projects, whether, you know, whether that needs to be included? Yes. <laughs> Are there any further questions? Councillor Walker. Um, again, just without, obviously it's, it's hard just going over stuff that's already in there and being well written, but again, that difficulty... Um, so I'll, I'll put this in the question. Are there any other examples? Because part of this is obviously trying to make sure the benefits accrue locally. Um, and I guess from from being around this table for a long time, that's often not the case. Have you got any examples of where that has been put into action successfully? Because I agree we should try and make sure that the benefits of the BCS accrue <coughs> locally, but... I'm worried they won't, but are there any examples where that does happen? Not that I'm aware of. Alrighty. Uh, any more questions? Last call. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. So, so that being the case, we should have a motion that will come up on the screen behind that our council approves the draft DCC submission with any amendments on uh, exploring a diversity credit system for Aotearoa New Zealand. I suppose we can leave out the words with any amendments, yes and uh, authorises the Mayor or Delegate to speak to the submissions and Chief Executive to make editorial amendments. Does anyone have any amendments they want to discuss, propose? Okay, so in which case I'll um, move that Council does that, seconded Councillor Houlihan. Uh, would anyone like to speak to it? Councillor Vandivis. I can't vote for this on the basis that it's complex. I can't see any realisable benefit for it. A biodiversity credit system to me uh, seems to be a kind of clone coming on the back of the long ineffective emissions trading system which has been billions to, uh, in terms of cost, it hasn't done anything for emissions. Um, Paperwork and credit systems like this, to me, are really a uh, bureaucratic nightmare that doesn't really do anything uh, in terms of improving biodiversity. Um, if, it was, if there was a practical suggestion in this and if it wasn't so complicated, I could vote for it, but as it is, it would need a strong argument. Right. Uh, Councillor Gary? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, we're not voting on this. We're actually uh, commenting on it. Point of order. I've been asked to vote on uh, approving this. Uh, misrepresentation. Um, a, a vote is what is called for, and that's what I would be doing one way or the other. Okay, so... Mr Mayor, I had not finished what I was saying. Yes, well... I but mean, happy to withdraw if yeah. that makes it more uh, easier for my colleague. I think I think that would be easier because you know, we do have to fine. approve That's the fine. draft submission. So. Yeah, and if you'd let me finish what I was going to say, uh, what I understand we are doing uh, when we vote uh, is we are voting on a submission that we're making which comments on a proposal uh, for a system uh, which uh, supports and 
enables uh, efforts in the biodiversity area. There are obviously a lot of questions that we have, um, and we don't know because we're in that uh, period of transition with a new government coming in. We don't know if this is going to come to fruition. Um, however, there were a couple of things that I wanted to say. One was that uh, I was I've been involved with and engaged with a number of the local. Uh, biodiversity groups recently, as it happens, and the doyon of these groups, uh, Lala Fraser, uh, who's been awarded um, Queen's medals and all sorts uh, and works very hard in the local community around biodiversity, uh, has commented, as others have, around their real concerns at the moment about funding um, and, and how that's going to be going forward. So I think there are concerns out in the community. I'm really interested to see where this goes um, and how it shapes up. I do know from my experience on the grants subcommittee that uh, small amounts of grants uh, provide seed funding and do extraordinary work because of the volunteers that we have in the city working and many of them actually are 70 years plus which always astonishes me uh, very active committed people who give volunteer hours so um, I certainly will be supporting the submission thank you to the staff for their mahi um, and their explanation of complications it was a complex one I hadn't heard of it before I was really interested to read the report uh, and let's see where this goes to but certainly it addresses a concern that there is in the wider community around some of our wonderful environmental projects. Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thank you. It's not the first time I sit around this table. I've been inspired to speak because of um, <coughs> comments of Councillor Vandevers, um, who indicated there's no benefits from this, and that's that's he's entitled his personal opinion. But the benefits that would accrue from something like this is actually the protection of our unique and invaluable. Um, biodiversity, actually the basis of all life on Earth. Um, so fairly, fairly important stuff. Um, also, I'd like to thank the staff for having to do this work, actually, in the context of um, it's a difficult discussion document because of the amb ambiguities I alluded to earlier, and also in the context of, um, of, of, a, of an unknown government change, which um, I think could probably see this potentially binned, which would be a real shame. But, it, uh, but that said, it might it might rear its head in some other form. So I do thank them, but it, it is, um, I mean, writing anything when there's unanswered questions and points to be clarified and lack of detail, etc., cetera, is, is, uh, is bloody difficult. So so well done. And I think, as it says in, in, in the submission, this is a really complex um, system that requires um, substantial resources um, and, implementa and impl implementation that needs to be, um, at the very least, um, equitable, um, accountable, and sustain sustainable. So, um, I do I do fear, as I say, that this may not see much light beyond the formation of a new government. But that said, um, let's just hold it in our minds for some future point. So, um, thank you. Okay. So. Um, in closing this, <laughs> I'd just like to mention that I do actually agree with the, both the previous two speakers um, because of uh, well, a whole range of things. Uh, firstly, uh, the very good point that Councillor Gary made about little amounts of money being distributed to volunteers in the community. We've, we have seen a lot of that from our grants um, and distribution where groups of volunteers get up and are enabled and empowered to be able to uh, do great work in our community and pull others along with them. And also, I think uh, the point that Councillor uh, Walker makes about the unique biodiversity, uh, on the weekend I was away with a couple of medical professionals and we ended up in a discussion about um, antibiotic resistance. And so one of the things that there's quite a, an area of research in New Zealand to discover new antibiotics because of the unique moulds and fungi and um, biodiversity that New Zealand has that other countries don't have because we've been an island for, you know, islands for so long. Uh, that biodiversity um, is being constantly researched and new antibiotics developed because Lord knows we've worn out some of the ones um, that we've already got. So uh, I think Biodiversity is very important um, to us as um, 
as humans, but also to the planet as a whole in terms of ecosystems. So I'm happy to support this. And um, you know, I, mean, I hope that might be sufficient an argument for sufficiently, sufficiently strong an argument for others to support. Having said that, I'll now uh, put the motion. All by division. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, call it. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wetherill. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12 1. Very good. Moving on to item 14 the inquiry into climate, climate uh, adaptation. So, Ms Moran and Mr Rowe, do you have any comments to start us out? No. Questions? Do we have any questions? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question on page 129, paragraph 3. It mentions that the DCC submitted on the topics of the National Adaptation Plan and the Natural and Built Environments Bill and Spatial Planning Bill um, submitted in June and February. I wonder if any of our um, submission points actually made it into the bills. Do you get a reply back that says, thanks for that, we, uh, we took these points into consideration and this is what we did? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Typically, no. Um, I would have to consult with colleagues who lead those submissions to get a sense of... They may well have been reflected, but I don't have that information yet. And my next question, I guess, because we have six submissions today, um, and I see that Local Government New Zealand are submitting on the Emergency Management Bill, and I just wonder, um, do we work with Local Government New Zealand so that we're not double double dipping, should I say, if we have, because um, this is a lot of submissions and obviously a lot of work for people, I guess, um, Ms. Rain, this is probably a question for you. Um, do we, does, does council work with local government New Zealand or um, do they put out a list of what they're submitting on? Because I see they've got a submission for the emergency management bill that just went up on their website today. But I just wonder about the others and if we're double working. Um, sorry, being new to this area, I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer that question clearly. So I can. As part of the analysis we do when we decide whether to submit or not, we look at whether Taituara is submitting and whether LGNZ are, and whether we have a unique point of view. In this case, the assessment was made that given the issues we have within our own community, we were likely to have a view that we wanted to represent. And just specifically on this submission, we have spoken to LGNZ and ORC in development of the DCC position. Councillor Walker. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, and thanks for this this work. It's um, excellent, great, great up submission. Um, just my question is around that the issues issues and options paper notes there is currently no enduring comprehensive system for community-led retreat and adaptation funding in New Zealand. Just wondered if there are examples of such a fund anywhere else, either in New Zealand or, or, or abroad, that you may have looked at? Uh, not that I'm aware of at a national level. I know in Australia some of the states um, have some uh, mechanisms in place, and I know that MFE is looking at that in their wider, uh, wider work. And you guys, you, you, you look at that, in, or is it an MFE? Um, the sort of, the submission deals with a couple of elements. One is around that national framework yeah. for funding, um, which we said in the submission really needs to be a balance of quite kind of clear and structured and explain what, what would and would not be funded at a national level. At the same time, leave enough flexibility for local application and <coughs> us to make some decisions at this end. So, um, our main focus, I guess, in terms of looking at peers overseas has been what's, what does the local level piece look like? Um, and I guess leaving Wellington to um, spend most of their attention looking at the national equivalent. And in terms of, I mean, a big part of what you talk about is um, 
the, the definition of community led, and I think you 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 sort you were sort of calling it planned or managed relocation. Is that something that's emanated from from here, or again, is that something that's emanated from looking at other examples? Because I think obviously it's very sensible. The so the paper offers a few different options around what terminology could be used. Um, I think there's a bit of a view about well, it's a really tricky issue, obviously, and changing its name doesn't make it any less difficult. So, and I think the concerns flagged in the paper are if you change the name or the common terminology from managed retreat to community-led relocation, it implies in a whole number of different things. One of them is that it's going to be community-led, and I think the point we make there is while, while we're 100% supportive of um, working actively with all communities affected, um, retreat's not necessarily going to be supported by communities in all instances, and it's not necessarily going to be led by communities in all instances. It may be required to be led by government or by local government or other entities where you know there's um, high-risk, um, unavoidable risk or, or whether it's just necessary to ensure safety of the community. So there's a risk that if you call it something, people are going to think it's that thing, and then it may not be. Um, so we've, I think we've suggested sort of managed relocation. Um, some people don't like the retreat term. Relocation is maybe a substitute that people are more comfortable with. Very good. Councillor Gary? Thank you. And <laughs> Councillor Walker's question is a really good segue into what I wanted to ask, which is kind of on that managed relocation. What I took from this submission, thank you for it, um, is that words matter. Do, do we have, I'm going to come at the question from a slightly different angle, do we, you believe, have a unique perspective on this compared with other areas in New Zealand? Um, given some, there have been forced retreat because of a uh, weather event. Um, would you say that ours is a unique lens? I would say ours is unique, but that every perspective on this is probably quite unique because adaptation is so localised. Um, the particular set of characteristics in terms of the community, the hazards at place, the resources available, everyone has a slightly different take on it. Um, there's a number of points that the paper addresses around um, potential resistance in the community to retreat and that can be linked to um, their available resources, options for places to move, um, connection to the land. So again, everything's quite specific to the local context. And I really liked the uh, the point about it not being the end game um, is not just an end game. So could you just explore that a little bit more for us? Uh, so one of the things we're looking at, and particularly in a South Dunedin context, is rather than having lining managed retreat up as that end result after you've tried everything else, can it be something that you look at early um, that might, one, free up land that's going to be really high risk in coming years and decades that can then, then be either used to, say, reduce risk for surrounding land by building new infrastructure in that place or nature-based solutions. And you you sort of pair it with a whole lot of other approaches. So rather than being the thing that you do last as a last resort, it's something that enables you to do a lot of other things. And then it also was spoken before about funding options and that if you started to think or take these um, take these approaches really early, say before the risk is intolerable, you might be able to retreat from areas in a slow, gradual way that even introduces revenue streams into the mix that then offsets some of your long-term cost, and you start to look at quite a different picture. Thank you. I thought it was very well articulated. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. Um, and thank you for highlighting the issues with the terminology. I think the semantics do matter. And I agree with the comments that have been made earlier, um, especially in the context of the demonstration we had at the public forum of a resident totally disconnected from any of our consultation processes. Um, and I think the text of paragraphs 8, 9 and 10 um, put it very well. So my compliments and thank you for the effort. Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, <clears throat> thank you, and I apologise if I misread this. I read this, I was getting a bit uh, 
reading fatigue by the time I got to this, I have to say. Um, so point 0.52 and point 0.53 in um, the submission on page 135 and 136, where you talk about, you say here, the DCC suggests for ratepayers should pay for the cost of adaptation where they benefit for adaptation responses, e.g. protecting critical infrastructure, then you talk about text pays. And then the next paragraph, we agree that central government should help councils meet adaptation costs where a problem is sufficiently large or complex that it cannot be addressed by communities and councils. So if you read those two together, I'm just not sure really where our position is because, I mean, obviously, from I would thought from our perspective, we would like central government to fund as much as possible rather than the ratepayers. And I'm just wondering whether the way I've read that, um, are they supposed to? Are they mutually exclusive, or what really is their position? Or yeah, I may have misunderstood. Them. Um, sure. Uh, I guess uh, ultimately, there's two groups of individuals that will end up paying ratepayers and taxpayers, right? Often the same person. Yep, often the same person. Um, so I guess there's we're signalling support for a principle where uh, where you can more clearly identify who the beneficiary is. Um, and where it's more localised, that we would support a process where there's also a sort of more localised contribution to that, um, whether that's um, at a regional level, at a sort of city level, or even at a community level. What that looks like, we still don't know yet. And uh, there's a few comments in there around, this all needs to sit in a whole system. Like, it's really difficult to look at one particular part of it in isolation. So if you have a national framework that talks about you know, the, these are the requirements on councils. This is what they have to do in terms of planning, um, infrastructure provision, etc. Um, this is what the central government will pay for. This is what we won't. You can start to kind of build that system. Great. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. Um, my theme of the day, um, that again, the ambiguity and uncertainty, I guess it sits with a new government and in terms of the, and feel free not to talk about this if you can, the indicative business case that sits with Treasury, um, is there any sense or feedback as to whether or not that will, will be affected by a potential new government, or is it just simply an unknown at the moment? I think unknown. Um, maybe unfortunate timing in terms of submitting it in the proximity to the general election. Though at the same time it's... Um, a nice hook um, in order to open a conversation with the new government. All right. Are there any further questions? Right. Now, uh, so thank you very much. Now, uh, I believe there is a um, an amendment coming, so. At this point, shall we? Uh, I move that we adjourn for five minutes to allow time for the amendment to be prepared. Seconded, Councillor Fiso. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? Carried. So on the screen, uh, this is. Par a new p well, this is paragraph 19 in the document in front of you. That is paragraph 23, so it's simply been changed in order. So that there is no change in wording to what is up there showing is paragraph 19. Paragraph 20 is a replacement of what had previously been paragraph 19 in your written document, and it is rewritten, and the councillor will speak to that. So that th those are the changes. Is that, have I correctly summarised that, councillor? Okay. They're on pages 131 and 132 of the submission. Yep. Something's, yep. So, what was 23 now becomes the new 19. And what was 19 moves down one to become the, the new 20. Suggest you move this as an amendment. Yes, so first we better discuss to see if we. So 19, which was 23, is unchanged. But 20, 19 is 
the old 19 has been morphed into this new 20. That would speak to the the reason for the change and it's for the councillor to address when yes, we so get to speaking to it. Councillor Viso will now explain why paragraph 19 has been changed to paragraph 20 that you see, that you see before you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, and thank you uh, to Ms Adamson and uh, all the government support officers who had to send a, um, a Microsoft Word doc over from the Civic Centre to so that Ms Adamson could make the changes. Uh, and thank you um, for your guidance, uh, CEO Graham. Um, the reason that I reprioritised from my um, having been an activist on Te Tiriti issues since about 1983, um, I moved up what was in the version uh, paragraph 23, which talks about our, our strong support uh, for basically Māori mana whenua aspirations, uh, up to um, 19. Uh, so that that is so that the aspirations and the kaupapa, I suppose, is put ahead of the, um, as the first paragraph of the Tiriti-based adaptation response. And then in 20, I have added the words, while we are constrained by the principles, um, of the Treaty of Waitangi, um, and not many people understand, or, although it's you know become part of our culture, especially our government departments, uh, our requirements is um, that it actually came out of the 1987 lands case when the New Zealand Māori Council took the Crown to court uh, uh, regarding the treaty of the status of the Treaty of Waitangi. Te Treaty of Waitangi was signed by most Rakatira and the only version signed by Lieutenant Governor Hobson. So to, to my mind and to um, those of a lot of people who have been working on this issue all their lives, uh, the principles are actually a watering down even of the Treaty of Waitangi, which is is not the Te Tiriti or Waitangi. So I beg your um, indulgence. I'm, it's a bit pedantic, but I just wanted to indicate that we actually do know our history. Kia ora. Yep. So uh, I'll just paraphrase that ever so slightly to my mind. Uh, reading what you've got here, you're really saying we, su we support aspirational efforts towards Te Tiriti versus the Treaty in terms of consideration of this, the whole topic of, well in particular uh, concerning the topic of managed relocation. Yep. So I just want to check that I've got that right. Are there any questions of the, the alteration to the submission? Because what this is, what the councillor suggested is that we alter our submission um, to the inquiry on climate adaptation. Councillor Hunan. Once this is, if, if we approve this, will that apply to all of our everything in council or just this? This is, a, we're altering a submission to the I know, the but if we say we're going to be doing to treaty, will that mean it covers all, you know, will that then set a precedent for all our council things, or is that just for this? That's what I'm trying to clarify. If I may, Mr Mayor, this is a, a particular submission on a particular topic, um, and so the precedent were council to set one wouldn't be set in a submission to government. Are there any further questions? There appear none. All right, so the first thing would be to vote on this submission. So on the amendment. On the amendment. So uh, personally, I'm ha so you, you want to move the amendment? Okay, so Councillor Fess will move that we amend our submission as we have seen. Is there a seconder for that, Councillor Gary? Okay, so all those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you, David button in my office, I press that, it says that was easy. <laughs> so there we go. Now the inquiry into, uh, 
Yes. Sorry. No, but moving to this one here, that we now move that we approve, authorise and authorise. Is that correct? That's what I'm thinking. Because we've answered questions, so uh, so I'll move, or just, would someone like to move that? Would you like to move that as well, Councillor Fisser? No, no, 14, the inquiry into climate, uh, climate adaptation, the submission, would you, would you like to move uh, that Council approves the draft uh, DCC submission? This is shown... If I can just... The GSO probably, Lynn, if you need to change, it's the approves the amended Dunedin City Council submission. So that's the motion that you see before you. I mean, I'm happy to move it, but... I, OK, so I'll move that Council approves the amended DCC credit system for Aotearoa, New Zealand, and authorises the Mayor to speak to it. Yes, OK, I've got it written here. So... Uh, that, Council approves the amended DCC submission within uh, into the inquiry on climate and the Chief Executive to make any minor editorial amendments. All right. I can just read it from my order paper here. So So did I have a seconder for that? Councillor Gary. Very good. Who would like to speak to that? Councillor Gary. All I wanted to say was words do matter, and they matter in this particular case in Kamehi Nui, uh, Councillor Lafiso. Any other speakers? We have not. In which case I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? No. Okay. Recorded, please. Div division. So, um, Ms Adamson, can you call the division, please? Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12-1. Thank you. Item next is number 15, page 143. Advancing New Zealand's energy transition submission. So, Ms Moran and Ms Reynolds. Any preliminary comments? I'll just preface by saying that um, there's quite a broad range of topics that are quite complex and technical in this, so we um, focused our submission on areas we thought DCC had particular um, interest or that um, sort of drew on our existing work in the zero carbon plan and, and zero carbon policy. Thank you. Questions, please, councillors. Councillor Gary. I had a question, it was uh, page 145, and it's regarding the interim hydrogen roadmap, point 20, and I just wondered, I'm not a science nerd, um, heavier hydrogen fueled trucks, how much heavier? I'm not sure in terms of actual weight, but I have um, read a study from Scotland that estimated um, if their fleet were changed over to hydrogen, um, it would increase road wear by 6%. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Of course, electric vehicles are heavy too, right? <laughs> Correct. He heavier indeed, yep. Yeah. Okay. We're done with questions. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hold on, team. Hold on. I, I can yeah. put this as a question or I can include it in the speech later if you'd prefer. Put it as a question. We have people who can answer. If we look at number uh, three, the consultation scope includes, and look at the bottom point, implementation of the government's commitment to ban new fossil fuel baseload electricity generation. Why would you ban gas baseload electricity generation simply to import millions of tonnes of low-grade Indonesian coal to fill the void? Uh, are you asking our experts to just Yes, anyone that can give policy? me an answer because that's what's been happening the last three years. Um, there's, there's a number of documents um, from the government that do speak to this. Um, what it sets out is, A, this is something that government has committed to, I believe, through the Emissions Reduction Plan, um, and B, that in the base load um, document sets out that the renewable sector is actually, in most cases, um, more affordable energy than, um, than fossil fuel generated energy. All right, so there we go, thank you. Um, so here we are. So, we're happy with the submission. Uh, so I'll move that we, that, that Council approves the draft Council submission on advancing New Zealand's energy transition and authorises the Mayor to speak to it and the Chief Executive to make editorial amendments. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor O'Malley. Would anyone like to speak to it? If our government really wanted to advance New Zealand's energy transmission, there are a number of very easy and inexpensive things they could do. The first would be to promote distributed generation by paying a decent price to anybody that was generating in a distributed way. That is to say, any solar power installation around the country. Currently, most solar power installations that I'm aware of don't bother connecting to the grid because they make it too hard and they don't pay you enough money to, uh, for the power that you put back into it. So if we were to advance energy transition, that would be the first thing to do. It would take a tremendous load off the grid. It would reduce the cost of the grid. It would increase, uh, improve energy resilience. It would do everything except please the corporates that run monopolies in terms of power generation and distribution. Government won't do it, supposedly because those corporates are having their own way. In terms of implementing the government's uh, ban on new fossil fuel baseload, that ban fails to address the enormous difference between burning wood, which is what we did a thousand years ago, burning coal, which is what we did a bit more recently, and now burning gas, which is a vast improvement on either of the two, but is still a fossil fuel. The burning of gas is New Zealand's answer to, in the short term, uh, giving us the least uh, amount of pollution for the best uh, electricity um, peak production that we desperately need. And instead we have a government that has been virtue signalling by saying, oh no, we're not going to uh, burn our own gas here and import millions of tonnes of dirty Indonesian coal to keep our peak uh, lights on anyway. To me, the virtue signalling to me, the failure to address real energy needs. To me, the talk of hydrogen, when Toyota now have uh, working a battery that's going to come out in 2027, which is half the weight, uh, double the power of uh, current uh, lithium batteries for EVs, and can be charged in 10 minutes. Um, the fact that this battery technology is on the way, that we've had prototypes and various kinds 
pipelines, uh, promising to make hydrogen completely irrelevant. Um, good to see that the national government has already recognised that Onslow as a battery storage was a completely unaffordable irrelevancy, again virtue signalling. Uh, none of what's in the submission to me makes any sense at all. I can't uh, vote for any of it. It seems to be driven by some kind of religious zeal wanting to send us back into the Stone Age where we don't have plastics, we don't have gas, we don't have petrol. Doesn't even recognise uh, how, um, how wonderful electricity is as the latest store of energy and as the future store of energy, and as the infrastructure is already available, wanting to introduce hydrogen under these circumstances, to me is simply backward looking and the realm of religious zealots. Can't vote for it. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. I wasn't, for, uh, I wasn't going to speak to this, but. Um, <laughs> and actually. <laughs> No, actually, it's not Steve's disease. I, I only do it this once, I hope. Um, but, yeah, um, you know what? As much of some of what Councillor Vandervis has said, I, I can't disagree with, I think. But there is, a quite, there is a bit there that I could. But the key thing being is, obviously, I, I, I understand why this paper has been written and the framework that it's been given. I also understand where we're at with our goals of carbon 2030. So I understand all that, and, and actually I think this is actually a very solid document, and it's a very strong letter that we're sending through. The part that I would like to actually really focus on is in regards to the conclusion where that the DCC submits that local authorities have ambitious climate targets are well placed to partner with central government to deliver climate action or pilot initiatives. And I think there's probably only one word that I'd like to have incorporated there is to have the gov central government to deliver climate action on funded pilot initiatives. Maybe they'll throw us some money so we can pilot the initiatives for them and be a leader in that space. <coughs> and that's the only change that I would like to make. But um, yeah, otherwise, I, even with all my views, I think it's a good letter. Very good. Councillor Alley. As a science nerd, I couldn't resist coming back. Um, I'm not sure where Councillor Vandervis is saying that this this um, this submission actually supports hydrogen because if, if you look at um, point 28, we actually quite explicitly say due to the energy intensive process of creating hydrogen, direct electrification and biomass based energy sources seem more suitable. So we actually quite literally make the very same statements and and we do it again. Um, further down saying that we submit that investment in rail infrastructure rather than substituting hydrogen into the road freight system would have greater benefits in affecting energy use and by reducing demand on road infrastructure. So we actually don't seem to in our own submission get too hot on hydrogen at all. Basically raise that very point that, it, that it, while it may have promise, probably not as good and as effective and as promising as direct use of electricity in New Zealand where we can produce it in a renewable form with probably the greatest ease other than Iceland. Thanks. Councillor Walker. Yep, and yet again, um, thank you thank you for the lead in. Shush, please, Carmen. Um, yeah, um, I think just, I'm going to go off, slight, off topic slightly here and just go back to what Councillor Vandervas was talking about. And I think we should actually be proud of ourselves in New Zealand. We're one of the highest... Um, generators of um, renew new, renewable energy at 87% and the envy of the world actually, hence the reason that lots of investment portfolios from the United States and Europe invest in our uh, electricity companies. Um, the main ones being Contact, Genesis, Mercury and Meridian, uh, who've all invested uh, billions of dollars in that space. Not to mention, in fact, and I've just got the page here, lots of smaller suppliers who do get their food in the door uh, Companies like Dy Dy uh, Dynamec, um, Electronet Group, Haringa Energy, Manawa Energy, um, and Pioneer Energy, to, to, to name a few, and all of those spaces, all of those companies are into the renewable energy investment space. 
encouraged by the market, actually. Um, so if there's anything in the information we got, my eyes lit up and was proud of the fact that we are going to follow the implementation of the government's commitment to, to, to ban new fossil fuel base load electricity generation. And if that is the death of plastic, so be it. Councillor Hulane. I can ask, uh, I can't help but ponder on the religious zealots. Who are they? What do they look like? What sort of thing do they worship? Energy, is it? Well, I'd just like to know a bit more about this. So, are there any other, any other speakers? Thank you. Uh, look, I think it's a um, perfectly good submission. And uh, as has been pointed out, we don't um, make much of... Well, we don't go uh, very deeply into hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, is a perfect fuel um, and would be ideal if we could uh, produce it inexpensively. Uh, but that, uh, we point out that that's not the case at the moment. But you never know. I think it's still worthwhile uh, researching it because I have had discussions about chemical production of hydrogen. And I have read, I did read somewhere once that there's a a hydrogen well, so there's hydrogen emanating from the ground from some underground source. I'm not sure how it comes to be produced, but I have read about that. But I mean, if you could tap into sources of hydrogen, because of course once it hits the atmosphere it dissipates really quickly, but if there were uh, sources of hydrogen that you could actually mine, that would be an amazing thing. You know, that would could be endlessly produced by some subterranean action. Anyway, be that as it may, I think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, submission and I'm happy to support it. So, <clears throat> so having said that, I now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. And we, division. Ms Adamson, could you call the division please? Councillor Barker. Aye. <coughs> Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12 1. Thank you. Item 16 The Needham Heritage Fund Activity Report, which we are to note. Mr. Maudsley and Mr. Ward. Excellent. So, any preliminary comments? No. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Gary. Mr. Maudsley, uh, although it, it isn't on the list, it's relevant. Could you explain, or do you recall the amount of money the Heritage Fund? Uh, gave to support the Pokahiki Church and for the benefit of um, colleagues the restoration after a, a number of many years was celebrated at the weekend and could you could you explain the significance of that restoration please? Yeah certainly Councillor Gary. Um, the exact figure I don't have in my head it was spread over three grants 55,000 um, so they uh, attach. They they went about that restoration in a three-stage uh, process, um, starting with the foundations and exterior, and then working to the interior. Uh, but that was a building that was very close to falling into complete disrepair, and they've worked um, as a community trust and organisation over a very long time to uh, fundraise for that project, um, coming to both the Dunedin Heritage Fund and then partnering that funding with another um, number of community funders. Um, and then also then delivering the physical works in a series of stages. And uh, could you comment on the um, the local craftsmanship, because that's something we talked about recently uh, as councillors, and I'd be interested to know around the input into the project. Yes, yeah, certainly. Look, um, as a timber construction building, they were very fortunate to have a carpenter who had some very good traditional skills and was able to go through that with some fantastic detail and recreate a lot of the traditional details and complement that with um, upgraded materials where there was going to be a clear benefit on the, in the longevity of the building. So they were very fortunate to have a craftsman that was dedicated to that project. Um, and then also partnering that with um, dry stone walling. They had a contractor who was able to rebuild all of the walls at the perimeter of the site. So a great combination of, of teamwork. 
um, from painters to sound system to heat installers, as well as those traditional trades. And not to speak of the tools made for the craftsmen. We have no further questions. Oh, we do. Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, and I note on number nine where you talk about what the grants contributed to. Is there a priority in terms of how you determine to give out the grant? Um, is it that kind of a list or is it if they've already secured so much of funding for the project or how, you know, you just mentioned about the church but it's fallen into disrepair and so, you know, giving funding now is sooner rather than later because later is too late. Is, is that sort of the things that you look at in assessing the priority? Yes, yeah, certainly. When we review the applications, we have a matrix we put them through that um, lists the type of work they're doing with the conservation outcome versus just more generic repair, as well as the importance of the place. So, um, you know, it might be a Category 1 here at New Zealand Pauhiti Tonga, um, Plus place, or it may just be a character contributing building within a, a heritage precinct here. And so we put the matrix together, and it has those two risk and importance aspects, and that generates a score. Um, the score is the order in which the um, applications are heard and decided on. So higher priority projects are, are given priority in the in the agenda. Thank you, gentlemen. It's very good. So the. Um, Activity report uh, has been moved by Councillor Gary. Seconder for that. Councillor Barker, would you like to speak to it, Councillor? I would like to speak to this. Um, and the point I want to make is the funding that we give, it's never the whole amount, of course, and it speaks to a comment I made earlier on another report that that base of funding can sometimes lead to extraordinary results, and that is the case with this fund uh, and, and the outcomes for our city. Um, and one of our points of difference as a city is our beautiful heritage buildings, and we speak about that often, but I want to focus on two buildings because they were very much in focus at the weekend, and I visited both. In fact, I did a shift at one while we had visitors. Um, I attended the restoration celebrations for the Pukahiki Church, which is 155 years old and looking extraordinary, and I saw the craftsmanship of Stuart Robertson, a local farmer who has amazing skills and uh, had stripped back all of the beams inside. The work was beautiful. We heard from a 90-year-old who'd been on the trust and had been part of the community that had led the restoration efforts. Um, and it was humbling, to say the least. Um, has clear links with the castle and the craftsmen, as I recall from my tour guiding days, the craftsmen who built the castle. And there are descendants still in that area uh, from people involved uh, originally. Um, so that was a joyous celebration. And, and so that's one church on the high road. Um, as you'll know, in the community we've lost a lot of churches, and it's the case on the peninsula. So it's delightful that we not only got a restored church on the high road, but also uh, on the low road at Broad Bay. And so I visited the Broad Bay Polish Church, and what you may not know, and again it had been the recipient of heritage funds at some point, it is referred to as the Polish Church, and the Polish community still worship there. It is the southernmost Polish church in the world and gets a great deal of attention from ambassadors. I think five in the time that I've been involved or lived in the area. It's 125 years old um, and it's about to celebrate 75 years of its current location. It was built by Polish settlers in 1899. In Waihola, they didn't have a church, and it was shifted in 1948 to the current site. And it's just won a national award for the beautiful paint job of the interior. Um, features beautiful stained glass, uh, and it is used by the community for community events and also for worship. So these two projects that our Heritage Fund has supported at some time or another that have uh, benefit and, and assured that those two churches, which at various times uh, were in the Pukahiki case, uh, the diocese was going to sell it uh, and in the Broad Bay Church there were murmurings of that um, the community, there was a community uprising about the mere suggestion um, we can now be assured that those two beautiful buildings uh, are assured in terms of their future 
for some time to come. And so the money we have invested, while it wasn't the whole amount, has certainly gone a long way to ensure uh, their future. And I have no doubt that the projects mentioned here um, will, will eventuate in the same kinds of results, either seeing if it's worthwhile to continue or and uh, to invest more money. Um, and in terms of private billings, make sure that we have beautiful buildings in our city uh, into the future. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, as Chair of the Heritage Fund, along with um, Councillor Benson Pope, who's also in the Heritage Fund, um, We'd like to thank Heritage New Zealand, um, Pauri Tonga, and um, the Southern Heritage Trust for their contribution because they also sit on the group with us. And I'd especially like to um, thank the staff for working to upgrade the, the process and the decision matrices. Um, Deputy Mayor Lucas asked about that, and I can assure you that the process has got a whole lot better and a whole lot easier for us to understand and the rankings are certainly there as to how important the buildings are, how urgent the, the work is etc etc so it's been um, a great process and we're also very much concentrating on having sound conservation planning because people come to us with all sorts of things, we're like got to get the basics right first. Um, so heritage is Dunedin's superpower, we have over 850 scheduled heritage buildings, 19 heritage precincts, over 1240 character contributing buildings and these are buildings that make our um, city look so lovely, um, 41 scheduled archaeology sites and a true gross, 144 category one listed buildings and when we think about that, that is really amazing. So that's why we need a heritage fund to make sure that we are looking after this. Over 50% of visitors come to Dunedin because of the heritage. So when we are investing money in these buildings, we're investing money in our economic development as well as our, um, our livability of our city. Those um, pre-COVID, there were over 2 million visitors that came to the city and they spent over $700 million into the city. The, sorry, that was the economic impact. So there's a huge economic impact that we are enabling with the, the small amounts and I, I knew the amount for the Pukahiki Church because I was going to bring it up so the um, Heritage Fund gave $55,000 for the Pukahiki Church and the actual project cost $720,000 however their first estimate was for $1 million and they have done extremely well to get all of the work done and I think what inspired me was that it was just such an amazing community project so I went up there and um, on the weekend and met a lot of the people who are involved in the project and I think there's something really really special when we get local people to make something like this happen and it was actually really interesting to meet a lot of the descendants of the people who'd worked on these projects as well, um, including Mr Riddle who worked on, on Larnet Castle and then the Landrists who did um, work on, on stone walls, etc. So I do thoroughly encourage anyone, everyone. I mean, Pukahiki Church is one of those buildings and you'll see in the, um, in the year that we have given grants to 44 buildings, which is pretty amazing really for the, the small amount that we put in to actually get all of this work done in the city and make it um, a better place to live. When we look at the, the ROS survey as well, um, there's quite a lot of comments in there that say that the heritage buildings need upgrading, cleaning and maintenance. So this is where this fund comes in useful. Uh, we are working on our heritage action plan at the moment, which I think we're expecting in November, um, which will hopefully come to us. So I hope that you'll remember, I'll, I'll remind you anyway, of those statistics about um, how important heritage is to us and how we can enable really great things to happen in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're done with speakers. So in which case, you write a reply? Yes, thank you. Um, and I concur with Councillor Barker around the uh, robust processes that are in place. Uh, she mentioned the $720,000 in the reduction in cost for that particular project at Pukahiki was because of talents within the community. They project managed it locally. And uh, that's something recently, and I just want to point out, is the hidden talents within our community are extraordinary. The bespoke skills within our community are extraordinary. Um, and that makes the difference on some of these projects and I can see Mr Morsley nodding his head. I thank him and Miss Bashup for the extraordinary work that you do and the team. Um, it really does make a difference and let's make sure that we um, value 
and retain those bespoke skills uh, so that we can get these wonderful outcomes uh, for our buildings. And thank you to the Heritage um, Fund Committee for all their work in distribution. Okay. Very good. With that, I'll put the motion. You see it on the screen behind me. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And on that, we'll have a five minute recess. We want a comfort stop? I vote. <laughs> I move. Yes, seconded, Councillor Hulan. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Sorry, councillors. <laughs> Timot Sophie. <laughs> I thought 21, because of the heavy traffic bypass, there's only a report for noting, so there's a couple of quick ones. No, we've been changing, no. I'll just, okay, so I'd just like to give us an ETF, estimated time of finishing. Um, so if we go to five o'clock, unless, or uh, we'd finish item 21, whichever comes first. So if we can finish item 21 by 4:30, we're out of here. And some of these are very, some of them are very quick items. There are any reports for noting? So it's item 21 or five o'clock, whatever comes first. Happy with that? <laughs> you get home early. The wine earlier. Yes, one o'clock. Alrighty. And on that note, uh, we're at the cruise update report. We have Ms. Van der Vleur and Mr. Christie to the table, please. Thank you. So, go straight to questions. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the report. Just a couple of things. Um, the report mentions that um, Stats New Zealand are no longer measuring cruise expenditure. Just why has that happened? Um, it's through just the cost-cutting um, measures and the fact that crews paused for three seasons almost, they stopped doing it and they haven't picked up. Crews New Zealand are actively um, campaigning to get them back, measuring that and looking at other options as well for collecting the data. So we're very aware, like nationwide, we need that. And the second Second point, uh, it's just point 11 where you state that uh, Waka Katahi has taken the lead to refresh the incident plan in the event of State Highway 87 being closed. I assume that's State Highway 88. My apologies, my mistake on that. Yes, and I could report actually now that that um, incident plan has been complete and true for circulation as of today. It just came back through before. Fantastic, thank you. Councillor Fiso? Tēnāko e Mr Mayor, tēnāko rua. Um, thank you for all that mahi. And um, my question relates to point 12. Um, how, long, how, how often pre and post uh, cru cruise season do, does the Cruise Action Group meet? Cruise Action Group meets as required. Uh, so through the season, if any issues come up that the Cruise Action Group needs to meet, they will meet. We're meeting quite regularly at the moment because we're trying to just get that um, cruise action plan across the line. So you may be aware of um, Ms McElaine's, um submissions to the Civic Services Committee. Uh, any of her concerns, uh, the community board's concerns being addressed? We did have someone come along to the post, um, one of the community board at the post cruise meeting, where all the issues were um, actually updated and we do have a community board person on the action group unfortunately wasn't able to make it to the last meeting but um, we and we also have got a business representative from the Port Chalmers community on the board as well on the agenda um, action group as well just to give that balance um, and quite a few of the issues that arose last season, we've actually actively been addressing anyway, um, the transport one being one of them. Um, we've had very productive meetings with Port, our transport department and ORC who are responsible for the public buses and 
feel there's a very good outcome. For a starter, there'll be double the amount of public buses anyway because it's back to a full. So that will halve the problem and then they've put extra buses on. The issue of public toilets was only brought to our attention after the cruise season, so we've just put that plea out for everybody to please let myself know if it's public holidays um, or and Port Otago because between us we'll address those issues on the day at the time rather than, um, yeah. Councillor Gilbert. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of questions. First one, following on from Councillor Walker's question about the Stats New Zealand no longer uh, taking or collecting data. Mr Christie, I'm guessing it would be you that I'm pointing this at. Do we have any locally, any notion, idea, specific data, any kind of throw a dart at the wall and this is roughly what it's, the impact has been? Uh, we do know from previous years' data what the estimated value is from crews for the city, so we can extrapolate that uh, based on number of vessels, number of passengers that would be coming into the city. Um, look, we're hopeful that they will reinstate this data at a national level because it is useful um, for not only recording um, the activity that we can generate through crews, but also for future planning. Lovely, thank you. And uh, second question, item number 10, regarding the onshore power and Sydney being the, um, well, trying to place themselves to be the first ones in Australasia to have it. Are we any further down that track? Because I know there has been conversations since I've been around this table about it here. Are we any further down that track? So Port Otago have um, made it quite public that they require to, to actually power a large ship now would put all the lights out in Port Chalmers and Sawyers Bay, so the power to the port needs to be equal again to what it is to Sawyers Bay and Port Chalmers. There's a lot of infrastructure required. That's right. Aurora spoke about that the other night. OK. Sorry. Um, Deputy Mayor Lucas. And then <coughs> Councillors Benson, Pope, Wiley, Houlihan and Walker. Um, Thank you. Um, you answered part of my question in relation to the buses, but um, I understand that the train can run on certain days if the cruise ship is in by 7 a.m. And that's going to will that help address some of the the issues in terms of commuting? Um, that's actually the the actual excursion train can go down to port and pick up those that are on the excursion train um, and and take them from port. T through the Tyree Gorge rather than last year where they used heritage buses to pick them up on the port, transfer them into the city to the railway station where they ve then caught the train. So it won't be used for commuter, it will just be used for the excursion train to get those people. So it's, it's keeping some congestion off, it's uh, keeping the number of buses that would have been required on the day. So to an, um, 250 odd people, that would have been six buses at least anyway, so it's six less buses needed on the road on the day so they can do that. That's great, um, thank you. And on point 13, where you talk about um, the cruise action plan, I take it that's going to be in place for the 23-24 season, not the 22-23 season? Gosh, I have, have, this hasn't been proved, I'm so sorry, yes that's correct, 23-24. Thank you, and, and <coughs> Um, the ovation of the sea staying overnight. Now, is that a first where a cruise ship has actually scheduled to stay overnight? So will that have quite a significant economic impact um, that obviously their passengers actually can, you know, dine here in restaurants and do a lot more activities in the city? So that's going to, you know, and do you think that will lead to other ships overnighting here? Um, so we actually have had smaller ships stay overnight before. It will depend on whether they still expect them to dine on board and 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 the mix, the nationality really, of the passengers on board because some passengers will be of the view they've paid for their meal on board, they'll go back and they have very strict dining times on a ship that size. So it's we've got a lot more to find out in Port are actively trying to get a lot of that information for us. It also will depend on whether the captain actually say it closes access to the ship basically if the wharf is closed so they may have a curfew of all back on board by 10 o'clock for instance and they're not allowed off again until 7 in the morning so we're a wee way down the track from getting that information but once we actually have that um, we'll be able to 
um, advertise that to businesses that may be affected in the city. But the ship's not forthcoming with that information yet, and um, Port are just waiting on it. I Can I actually say now, though, that over the weekend the Ovation actually cancelled two of her visits. We're down to 127 ships now. I haven't been given a reason, we don't know it yet, but... The visit that was scheduled for the 17th of February has been cancelled and the one for the 18th of March. So um, this could happen over the season. There will be weather-related cancellations, no doubt, unless we're as lucky as we were last year. But yeah, So we're down to eight visits now of the ovation rather than ten. I'm just concerned. I mean, that's such a large ship at 4,000 passengers and, that, and the 18th of December is a m Monday night. So for our hospitality sector, I mean, that's a you suddenly land, well, even if it's three, half of them, two thousand looking for dinner. Um, you know, we need we need to let our hospitality sector know. Is, I mean, and I understand the issue, and that's where I was coming from. Thank you, right. Councillor Benson Pope, uh, Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Louise. You touched on it about um, losing ships um, as such, and. Um, and the fact that they, the cruise schedule does change, it does fluctuate, um, and that essentially, I, I recall it was about 5% that we have usually have around weather issues and the ships coming through the heads and high winds and the problem with tides. Yes, that's, that's always given as a, a good indication if you go on 5%. Um, and, you know, last year we were lucky that we only actually lost two for weather, but the forecasters are all saying we're going to have more heavy wind, which could impact us with um, four of our big ships. So we've got four ships now that are tide-dependent for coming in and out. They're also the ones that are more susceptible to wind too. So if the wind gets up to 40 knots at the heads, it's basically not considered safe for them to come in. Um, so it's wind for those ones and it's fog. So fog's the other thing that if we get a lovely clear day and it gets foggy at the heads, that can be the other thing. So we just hope, it'd be lovely to think we had a summer like last season, but um, yeah, so the weather, and it was weather that stopped the very last one at the end of the this past season as well. Um, and a follow-up question, um, that was a good pre-cruise meeting that Sophie and I attended. Uh, it seemed pretty engaged at the um, Edgar Centre. Um, and how have the visits gone? I know they were last week where a number of operators went and had a pre-inspection, pre-site uh, visit. Um, how's that all played out? So talking to my um, colleagues down there at Port Otago, because I call them colleagues because we're all part of a really, really uh, well-oiled machine when it comes to delivering crews, they've reported back that they've had a good uptake by operators that are down there and had their health and safety induction basically and know what's expected of them. And if they haven't gone through that, they actually aren't um, permitted to be on port anyway. So, Councillor Hulan. Thank you. I know one of the issues with the buses was that they were charging the um, cruise ship guests quite a lot of money to get on them. Is that still an issue or has that changed? So the price that the cruise lines put on their shuttles is their commercial decision. We won't, and we don't know what they're going to charge until the day they first arrive. Uh, but that is their decision and entirely theirs. And if they're going to be overcharged this year, I think we'll be able to cope with them in Port Chalmers and on our local buses. And hopefully the local service might make a bit more of a, make some profit on it on those days. And I really feel that this this season, unless something really um, goes really haywire as far as having the num right number of buses and drivers, we should be able to keep the local community happy and still have a good number of cruise passengers able to get the buses if they want to. And there has been a special stop um, put aside in town so that we actually have the cruise people going to their stop to get on it in town, which will just keep the hub not so congested and let the locals get on there first. So, um, Next Monday will be the, the trial as to how well it's going to run. And last season, were were people able to get on the train even if they weren't doing the following on with the further trip? No, last season the train didn't go to port at all. They used here. No. So 
but previously when the train has been used, were they able to get on it if they weren't carrying on to do the trip? No, it's never been used as a commuter train in all the years that I've been involved with crews. It's only ever been used for the excursion. Okay. Councillor Walker. Thank you, yeah, and um, anecdotally, um, if cruise ships are in overnight, it's, um, it's the local pubs that benefit, actually, particularly from the cruise, uh, cruise mem uh, workers, not the, not, the, not the passengers, it's the workers, that's right, eh? Yes, that's right, because it's an opportunity, they can actually give more of their staff shore leave, which is fantastic, and I've even heard that sometimes they choose actually not to go back to the ship at night and stay off, which is good for our accommodation as well. I've spent some time with them. Um, and in terms, I'll ask you a couple of questions just to help answer some questions. First one was from uh, Councillor Lafisa about the buses. It's my understanding, and I think this is a good move, that the bus drivers are also instructed at the first pickup point in port to leave some space for the locals, which I think is a really clever and good move. That's co correct, isn't it? Yes, that's correct, and I understand that will still happen. And secondly, you might not be able to answer this, but um, some people who are at the Aurora presentation the other night will be aware of the fact that the cost of putting ship to shore power, according to Aurora, is of circa 100 million. I've heard it's very expensive, so that doesn't sound unreasonable. Um, Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to check with you uh, around point six, which is around the um, biofouling. I'm assuming, because the ships have been working in the interim, that that won't be an issue this season we wouldn't expect. No, that's what's been indicated, the fact that they've been actively on the go and working and docking. That, But uh, once again, we're going to have to get the season underway to find out if that is the case. But it was the fact last year they've said that it got underway so quickly um, that took everybody a bit by unawares, unawares um, and the delay was having to go away offshore to clean them as well and having to wait on calm weather. So the fact that it's carried on through the seas in the industry on the Northern Hemisphere, we shouldn't have that degree of um, disruption from that this year. And what what would be your assessment of the sector? It's always been my impression that the operators in the past have been really good at being nimble because of the weather aspect. They've had to be really flexible and nimble. Uh, and then there's sometimes they, the ships stay overnight when they're not expected to. Is, is that still your impression? Because we have a, a bit of a change in the operators. Uh, yes, I think that still is. You know, um, they're pretty good at juggling around if they have to. And this season, we've got a few ships that are coming in quite a lot later, so they'll have to actually rearrange what they're doing. Those that are still in the industry and those new ones that are coming in, I expect they're going to be as nimble as they ever were before. And my final question is around the emergency planning. <coughs> Hypothetical question because only one road in. So, so say you have um, cruise ship passengers up at the Albatross Colony um, and there's an issue with a slip or something and they can't get back to the ship. And we, we have had those situations before on a minor basis, but not, I don't believe, uh, large bus loads of them. But there is planning, is there not, for such a situation? The planning at this stage is for Highway 88. Um, rather than the, the the roads around the city because in most cases around the city we have alternative routes. It's Highway 88 if anything gets stuck there, uh, the nature of the roads getting round and depending on where it happens. So um, that's the one that's done. If I can jump in in my different hat as controller hat, we have done a range of scenarios with the cruise ship in town with passengers um, off the ship and in the city, and we have exercised around that. So we do have plans, uh, but it will depend on the scenario we find ourselves. But there certainly are plans should we end up with um, any number of people on the peninsula. For example, um, Otako <coughs> are a, a place where we can host a, a large number of people should it be required. And is one of those options the ship delaying its departure, or is that fairly unusual? No, if the ship's got its own tours out and its own shuttles caught up, they will, in 95% of the cases, they will wait 
uh, they won't go and leave people that they've organised stranded. It's only those that have gone off and free independently done their own thing that will be left behind. And that happens now regardless of whether there's incidences or not. Not a lot, but it, it does happen. I, oh, sorry. I would add, though, that it will depend entirely on the nature of the emergency we are facing. And so the cruise ship is likely to abandon their crews if we have a significant event and just get everyone back to another place should a bad thing happen. So, as I said, we have a range of scenarios planned in a civil defence capacity. Thank you. That's reassuring, and I assume that was the case. I have driven <laughs> at high speed, I have to say, on one occasion to get people back to the ship. Um, but it's good to know that wider planning and let's hope we don't have to use it. Thank you. Good. Councillor Gilbert. <coughs> Thank you. Um, very quick question. Last season, or the season just gone, the drop-off point was just outside Toitu, which was very clearly of benefit to Toitu, and as it happens on Saturday, of quite good benefit to the farmers' market as well. Um, I'm wondering where the drop-off is planned. Is it still to be there or back to Octagon? Right, so... I. There is a dedicated cruise shuttle stop in the central carriageway. But, um, so when there's just one large ship, it will be the central carriageway. If there's two small ships together, they'll share the central carriageway. One large ship and a small one, it'll be the central carriageway and just out here for the small, where there's usually only one shuttle, in front of um, uh, um, Rialto. Um, when we've got two large cruise ships, we can't safely use the central carriageway. And on those occasions, it's outside Toy 2. Or if the, if the octagon's closed for a special event, it's moved to outside Toy 2. Now, there's 14 days this year that we know of it will be actually outside Toy 2 for that reason. Uh, how many of those are Saturdays, just out of curiosity? <laughs> could send the calendar for you with those marked on. Councillor Barker. I guess now I have two questions. Is um, There is a cruise ship calendar, and is that available online? Because I know that restaurants, because um, my daughter works at one, like to know when cruise ships are in. And then I know you have a database, a big database, but um, I guess the questions are, is the cruise calendar online, and how can people get onto the cruise um, database? Yes, it is online, um, and I'm, I think we've actually, item <coughs> item 17, we've actually, yeah, that's okay. Um, and people just need to contact the eyesight uh, to get onto the database, and we'll just put them on the outreach. Uh, we've got quite an extensive database. That If it's just an operator only, something that's only going to affect operators' message that needs to get out, we send it out. But if it's something that's just generally... Um, helpful to anyone that's involved with cruise then that goes out to that wider database. So I just want to ask about the cruise action plan because a lot of the questions that you're getting today are for, I'm imagining are all covered in the cruise action plan which is the working plan will be in place so will this plan come to council I don't I mean it's operational so it not, doesn't necessarily come to council but um, Will it come to council? Uh, council, no, that wasn't the intention because it hasn't in the past. Um, it does actually take into account everything that's in the DMP, so a lot of it talks to the DMP as well. So it wasn't the intention to bring it to council simply because our past cruise action plans haven't. They're very operational, actually. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's just a lot of the information that councillors are asking in the plan. So we, when the plan is finished, will it be... Um, online and distributed to the list? Yes, it will be online. I'm more than happy to share it with councillors anyway. Excellent. Right, we appear to have exhausted questions. Oh, question. Yeah, I've got Councilor. a quick question. Um, so if you're a business and you're wanting to let people on the cruise ship know that you're, you've, you know, you're operating here, do you would you go to the eyesight, give them information, and they send it to the crew to the cruise ship, or how does that work? So there's only so much information that the cruise ship actually wants. So you know they they're selling their tours, um, so we can't actually advertise tours on board. But the idea really is for businesses to be on the Dunedin 
NZ website so that people coming to visit Dunedin and looking at our website can actually see that they're there. It, it depends on the nature of the business too, actually. Great. Okay, thank you very much. We're done? Yeah. Um, Councillor Wiley has indicated that he wants to uh, move the motion and seconded by Councillor Gary. So, uh, would you like to speak to that, Councillor Wiley? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Louise and her team. Um, they do a sterling effort when it comes to crews, um, and along with Kevin Winders and his team at Port Otago, uh, they've also upgraded their facilities to assist with crews. Um, it is a moving uh, and challenging um, issue with no issue with uh, crews. Uh, it is a, a windfall for the city in many, many ways. Uh, um, you know, last year we had 101 ships, or last season we had 101 ships, 150,000 passengers, 73,000 crew, uh, and the spend for the city in the city was approximately 60 million. We're now increasing that to 127 ships, as we've heard. So basically an increase of 30% uh, for this coming season. The part that I was pleasantly uh, happy with when um, Sophie and I went to the uh, cruise action meeting, um, uh, uh, pre-briefing uh, meeting at the Edgar Centre was how engaged the, community, the, the tourism community was. Um, and that was probably the best that I'd seen in many years. Um, and to think I've been involved with the cruise uh, industry through uh, either through economic development or previously at Dunedin Host when I was on their board and I was the person that dealt with cruise. I was the board member that had that portfolio and we've come a long way. The best asset we have for the city is that we are the first or last port of call for nearly all the ships. And that is huge in the sense of actually we were the first place where passengers want to get off and spend their money or we're the last place where they want to get out, spend their money before they get on and, and move on to Australia. So we are a favourite destination. We always rate highly with the passengers. Um, and I know that from my experience because uh, the cruise group that I look after every year, they actually love coming to Dunedin. They love the feel. The passengers um, were fortunate enough to have an overnight last year and uh, on their ship, and they were just raving about it. Uh, great to have State Highway 88 travelling smoothly, uh, fingers crossed, and also um, thanks to IRC for adding the additional buses. Um, so let's hope the winds at the head are calm and the tides are favourable. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think I've spent my entire life dealing with crews, so I remember when um, being up the top of the, the tower and seeing the first cruise ship come in, so it's certainly grown exponentially, and I also was on the, the cruise action group when we did the, the first cruise action plan, which was kind of revolutionary for New Zealand because no one else had one, and I think at a briefing last week, um, many many ports still don't have them, so we are way, way ahead, and uh, I think our aim was to be the premier cruise destination for New Zealand, and I think we've really succeeded in that, and it's great to see the, um, the cruise action plan coming up again, and that's why I asked if it was going to be available for everyone, because I think that all of the questions that people have been asking, which is great because we get more information and we know more about cruise, will be addressed in that plan. Um, the issues that come up, the toilets, the, the buses, and I know that we've had COVID and some real issues around buses, um, are all being addressed, which is great. Um, and I think the, the huge asset is actually working with the community. We're in Dunedin, we have a really great visitor sector that actually talks and works with each other, and that's a real envy and apparently quite unusual in New Zealand. So it's a, re a really great thing to have, and then just to see them there excited about crews coming in. The average spend per person per port is $170, and some people say, oh, they don't spend much, but actually they do, and a huge amount of that money is actually spent in retail, um, and we see Everybody arriving in and heading down. That's why our aim was to get them parked in the octagon and off spending within five minutes of landing. So that's why it's really important to have them um, in the middle of the city. So the spend pre-COVID was um, $570 million. It's half a billion dollars um, 
in New Zealand, so this is a, why it is important for the, the city um, and a much needed boost into the tourism economy. I know my mother was particularly pleased about how many cruise ships were coming in because we get lots of high spending, high value visitors. Um, and I just also want to thank Port Otago for their decades of investment into cruise. We went to the Seafood Festival recently and it was great to actually go and see that cruise terminal because it used to be I think it was a pretty crappy old tent that the eyesight had at the start of it. So every year it's just getting better and better and I think that Dunedin um, should absolutely celebrate the investment that we've all put in, the way that the operators work together and being that, that, that premier destination. Something that did come up last week was at the Dunedin host meeting was uh, product <coughs> development as well and that we need to um, to make sure that we have good product to be sold by those those cruise operators. Councillor Hurlingham was asking how do you how do you get your product sold? And um, part of that is having export ready product and making sure that Dunedin has a great suite. And that's why I'm going to plug the train. The train is important because it is a high value product and one of the key reasons why cruise ships choose to visit Dunedin is they've actually got really good saleable product. Um, and that is a reason why they choose us. They don't choose us because we've got cheap buses. Um, they choose us because they can sell product to those uh, product experiences. Sorry, I shouldn't call it product um, to those visitors. And it's important that we invest in those as well. Looking forward to the first ship. Good. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. And I want to reflect on the fact that uh, when I attended the Dunedin Host meeting last week, there was positive anticipation from the operators uh, to the arrival of crews this year. And I think because it's really the first hopefully smooth season since COVID, um, and as um, as de Villiers said, um, uh, it's a well-oiled machine and there's no doubt about that at all and there's a chance this year, this season, for, for that to really shine. Um, I hark back to my time as a tour guide and four iconic um, attractions in Dunedin. I always thoroughly enjoyed the cruise ship passengers. I had a job because of the cruise ship passengers and so I'm very mindful there will be a lot of people who will get seasonal employment during this period. Um, I... I note that uh, one of my concerns in the past as we came back into cruise was social licence and I think that the um, issues that have been addressed lately around buses and, and so forth are very helpful in terms of bringing the community on board and gaining back that social licence. So I want to finish by wishing uh, all those involved in cruise the very best for the season, the communities receiving our visitors the operators for whom this is their livelihood and for our team and the teams at port that are involved uh, in organising and giving information and receiving the visitors. You do an outstanding job. And um, finishing, I want to just remind everyone that it's around our welcome, our manakitanga, to our visitors that we will be remembered for. So hopefully uh, they will receive that uh, when they visit our city. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's great, and thank you uh, uh, to Councillor Wiley for pointing out it's a financial windfall, and it is, and for that we, it, it needs to be um, partly applauded, but we also can't forget it's a, it's a huge environmental issue. It uh, has to be raised. It's known throughout the world. Um, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, over-tourism, effects on local wildlife, uh, to, to, to name a few. And those of you who do read and follow the cruise ship industry will be aware that other jurisdictions across the planet um, have put much, much stronger limitations on who can and how many ships can visit, visit their ports. And we are, we are way behind, partly because we're not a signatory um, to, 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 to MARPOL. So let's hope that Port Otago gets on board um, in terms of working hard to clean up um, its act on behalf of the community at large, and particularly the community out in Port Chalmers and the West Harbour that bears the brunt, unfortunately, of idling ships and their dirty emissions that me and others do have to breathe. <coughs> Um, it's there. It's, I'm being honest. I'm looking, looking them in the eye and saying there's a chance and an opportunity here to do the right thing 
and to protect um, New Zealand's and uh, Otapoti Dunedin's image out there in the world of a green, clean place. We can't have it both ways. So I do applaud that we can we can have we can have our cake and eat it here, but it also involves um, some of our bigger players coming to the party. Port Otago is. A, a, a successful, large, money-making organisation. I'd like to think that it would be prepared on behalf of the community to put some of that money uh, towards uh, protecting not only humans but um, some of those creatures, uh, that those tonga, that species that don't have a voice around this table. Thank you, Councillor Fiso. Uh, Tinakwe, Mr. Mayor. Um and I'd just like to acknowledge um, Ms. De Villiard, um and her team, and also, uh, as Councillor Walker said, the members of the Port Chalmers community and their whānau um, for the great sacrifice that they make uh, in order to be the gateway uh, for this incredibly huge calendar. I'd like to thank um, Councillor Wiley for moving and, and pointing out uh, his pertinent points and thank you also for the calendar. The first visit, the first ship comes in next Monday and then there's all seven pages of this thing or six pages until April so kia kaha to everyone especially in, in terms of those relationships, looking after those relationships and the manaki taka uh, that uh, Councillor Gary spoke of. Kia ora. Your right of, uh, your right of reply, Councillor Wiley. Um, yeah, thank you for um, a lot of those positive comments. Um, and yeah, Councillor Walker, I think the key thing is when we look at the cruise industry in Australia and New Zealand, the ships probably spend in excess of half a million dollars to uh, chug down here. Um, so they're basically, I think, will be one of the first global routes to get uh, the most uh, energy efficient ships and um, those ships are coming in between 2027 and 2030 uh, because the ships do not want to come down here and uh, and be big emitters because they don't want to, the amount of energy that they will consume on the voyage to New Zealand uh, out of Europe or out of um, Australia, or sorry, out of um, the US is pretty much the case and um, yeah thank goodness we're not some of the Caribbean islands that um, suffer many of the issues that and some parts of Europe that suffer many of the issues that they have uh, where cruise ship congestion so thank you very good so at that point at this point I'll put the motion that council notes the Enterprise Dunedin cruise update report all those in favour say aye, aye. against carried item number 18, Councillor Melly, have you got the people sorted? Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, you'll see in the papers that at this, at this stage of coming out, we didn't have um, three names, but I've um, gone around and asked different councillors if they're available, um, and I've sent the names to... Uh, is it, um, very good. So that's it. We've got three people now willing to do it. Um, and that pretty much is the item. <laughs> Excellent. OK, so uh, are there any questions for the Chair of Hearings? No? OK. So that's um, good. I'm going to move this, yeah. yeah. Once the questions are over. So we have no questions, so... No, you don't. Will you voice the motion? Yeah, I've moved it. I need a second. And seconded. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas, very good. Uh, so, will you speak to it? I don't think there's really much to speak to it. It's pretty much in the in the item itself is what we're doing this here. So basically, just coming up for review, and this is the panel that, that I've asked to speak that to be the panel to do it. It's all good. Does anyone want to speak to it? No. In which case, I'll put the motion. All those in favour that we appoint these three councillors to the hearing panel for gambling and TAB review policy, say aye. aye. Against. Carried. Item 19. Project China update. Mr Christie is here to answer any questions. Questions, please. Councillor Back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of this looks like it's economic development, and some looks like it's civic um, 
civic work. So where does the budget for this sit? Is it all completely within e Enterprise Dunedin or is it also civic budget? Um, yes, that's correct. It sits in both Enterprise Dunedin and civic. So what is the bu current budget for um, Project China? And I ask this because it says in the financial, uh, sorry, not the financial, oh, the LTP annual plan, the Project China budget and the 10-year plan will need to be increased to support Shanghai, Dunedin, Sister City, anniversary celebrations and delegation visits in 2024. So I just wanted to understand what the budget is now and then um, what it might be increased, looking to be increased to in 2024. Um, so the current budget that sits with an enterprise to need and is $38,000, which covers um, catering and venue hire, covers um, travel and uh, related costs, including accommodation and gifts. Um, there is a small civic budget of about 25500 for all sister cities. What I would add is um, that doesn't include a staff member's salary in John's team, but I, I don't want to say what that amount is because it will identify someone's individual circumstances. Oh, so can I just ask with the, the civic, we've got four sister cities, and I understand, does that cover the grants we, that each of does the 30... So. No, so that amount does not include the grants to the three sister cities that are active. That that's a, is a separate thing that benefits the society rather than our direct costs. Sorry, just my understanding that so the twenty five thousand dollars oh is that just for the China relationship, not for the other all the sister cities? I thought you said it covered all the sister cities. It does, but that's if we have inbound delegations if there are civic hosting responsibilities and it would be applied to any of those that were happening in a given year. The grants five thousand to two of the cities and eight and a half to Shanghai are additional to that money. So that's like another eighteen thousand dollars for. But they're grants, so they're not. A, the council has determined that those grants be given, so they're not available for us to use um, for any civic things that we are running. Uh, my next question, I guess, is just around Project China and Shanghai given the economic development strategy is 2013, whether there is any revised strategy or plans around our relationship with China and how we carry that out, or do we just keep doing the same stuff? Uh, so we have an annual work program that we discuss with the staff member involved, and obviously where we have relationships in China with, where we can see the greatest um, priority for us as a city. Um, so we've got, we've got active um, planning in place for this calendar year and for the next financial year um, around those sister cities that have been noted in the report um, and, and friendship cities because they all have, they all bring different value um, and they're all each, I suppose, in a, in a rebuild phase given that we've had um, an ability to get face to face for the last few years. So I'm aware that the Otaru sister city, there might be a delegation coming, I think maybe the end of next year, because I think they missed the 40th celebration of the anniversary. I know this is a Project China update, but is there um, all of the sister city stuff being incorporated into what might look like a budget for next year? Look, we're certainly aware of the fact that Otaru are looking at visiting and you know, the Mayor has also been invited to, to visit Otaru. Um, Edinburgh also is quite active in terms of the 50th anniversary coming up in 2025. Um, yeah, so those, those are all um, activities that we're aware of but don't have current budgets attached to them. But what I would say is we are in a 10-year plan process, so discussion um, will need to happen about where the and how much value council wants to put on the existing city sister city relationships, which is partly why we are flagging in this report that council will need to consider if how it wishes to fund the relationships and the activities, because the the current budgets that we have and allow the a pretty um, a relatively low level of activity, and if we are to have significant um, thirty year anniversary celebrations with. Um, Shanghai, for example, we will need to look at um, how we fund that, or if we, if we fund that and don't do anything else, for example. 
So will a report, oops, I haven't read the, the next thing that happened. Uh, it says that for the next step say that work will be undertaken to prepare for the 30 year celebration. So would we also be expecting a report to come to the long term plan outlining budgetary requests for sister city relationships? It may not be an um, individual report, but within the ED budget, um, there will be some discussion about what's been included and what hasn't been. Um, I have two questions, and one follows on from Councillor Barker in terms of the 30-year celebration. So Shanghai haven't indicated yet um, what they would like with their intent to visit, and I'm mindful of the, the Mayor's up-and-coming visit, and he may be put in a position um, where there's some expectation placed on whether we visit, they visit, but there's been no indication as of yet what, what that might, the 30-year celebrations might be. Um, we had some preliminary discussions when the Chief and I were there and a couple of months back. Um, they won't spring it on us. Um, we will back channel those conversations to make sure that the Mayor um, is approached in the right way around any levels of activity. So we are expecting there will be a high level delegation that will come from Shanghai to Dunedin and I think there is an expectation that we will also have a mural visit um, return back to Shanghai during um, the 30th year anniversary, which is 2024. Thank you. Um, my other question is in relation to the um, current delegation, and I note who, who's part of that. I'm surprised that there's no school representation. I know how active they want to be in the, in the international student space and how much of an impact that has. Um, are the Polytech and the university effectively um, representing them as well? Or you... Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, look, the schools are looking at doing a separate visit around um, timing that suits them for recruitment purposes. So we're working with the agents who are active in that market and um, the schools, we've actually got a, a further high school wanting to sign up a relationship with a, a, a school in Shanghai. So that, that MOU is being currently worked on and we'd like to think that there could be a delegation go um, early next year that will represent the education sector. Look, and I'll just add, um, in my time there we met with a number of um, secondary schools when we visited uh, and it's clear that John has their confidence and is well versed and was well briefed by the various schools so we sort of got double bang for our buck. Oh, that's a good segue into my question um, and I note in point 18, Mr Christie, that Treasury estimates uh, that per student $69,000 economic benefit. Um, and I just wanted to ask you around the rebuild of the international education uh, sector. I know the answer to this, but I think it would be helpful for my colleagues. The number of um, students from China, they won't necessarily all be from Shanghai, that we have as we re rebuild the um, sector in the tertiary area, first of all, Yes, so I understand the current number of enrolled um, Chinese students at the university is around 500. Um, that's obviously well down on where it has been traditionally and, and will be part of um, the reason why we're seeing university and polytech um, really keen to re-engage back into the China market. It's, it's really important to get face-to-face. Face-to-face relationships in China uh, are where you get um, the respect, um, particularly from parents who may be sending their, their children with their child often to, to New Zealand or other countries. So it's really important to give that assurance um, to parents that we're a, a safe place, um, that that local government is supporting um, by, by being part of these delegations as well. And my follow-up question is, is it true, uh, is it not that, uh, it's true, is it not that in the secondary section the numbers are much lower because the secondary sector is starting to rebuild slowly and diversifying as they do. Would that be a, a good summary? Yes, so a lot of the secondary high schools in particular lost key personnel um, during those years that they weren't active in recruiting students. Um, we're starting to see that rebuild and I think um, the China market is going to come back quite strong uh, from an education perspective. And we see it particularly in southern China, so Qingyuan, um, which is talked about in the report, we've had a number of delegations come to Dunedin for um, short-term educational tourism opportunities and that often leads into those children coming here and, and for uh, primary and secondary education.
And my final question uh, is around your project. China staff member, and I understand he's been working actively with a number of the secondary schools, and there's been some very positive feedback about the assistance he's been able to offer. Yes, the latest project was to talk about um, Chinese etiquette um, with the schools so that um, they were aware of how to, to treat um, the Chinese when they came here. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the Chen No Wong, is it he said? <laughs> Chen Wong, um, in the Guangdong province, is is one of the we're their only sister city. Is that correct? That seems that's really um, you know obviously I think very impressive. How was it? Do you think we were able to get that because of our long term relationship with Shanghai? Um. Look, we got that. We got that a few years. First, let's just correct: we're, we're their friendship city, not a sister city. There, friendship. Yeah, the, and there is a. We have four sister cities. One, and I think it's an important distinction. The Chinese don't make it to the same level, but we do. And and sister cities come with a special recognition um, here that are in a friendship city is a level lower, but still. It's still really significant, but I think it's important not to suggest that we've all of a sudden got an extra sister city. Yeah, that, that is correct. Thanks, Chief. Um, yeah, and look, that that relationship came as a result of um, contacts that were already here in the city, and um, in particular, there was interest in, uh, from the university and the polytech around student recruitment <laughs> into the Guangdong province. So as the report outlines, they've got a very, very strong focus in vocational education. And that's been really good for us in terms of helping to um, not only get students, but also to do teacher training. And, and we see that as, as an important area uh, for us to continue to work um, with both Guangdong and Qingyuan provinces and, and, um, and to ensure that we've got the university and Polytech on board with that. Thank you. And I know um, Councillor Barker mentioned the cost of some of these trips previously, but the cost of us travelling there or, or just costs of organising those things, would the, the benefits we get from it would far outweigh that, wouldn't it, financially? Is that fair to say? Absolutely, yep, yep. The numbers are staggering in terms of the value of education that comes out of a, a single trip. And um, with regards to my pronunciation, Chung Na Wong, <laughs> um, it, is, it sounds like they've, they're really interested in the new technology and I wondered if, there's, if that would benefit something like Code and Startup Dunedin and those, is that some of the things you're looking at, maybe taking delegates from those areas? Or? Yeah, so the technology space is certainly one um, that we had interest expressed to us uh, and when we visited it's gone that whole district is going very high tech and and it's it's a very large area and there are multiple opportunities including um, not just code but also the work we're doing on digital interactive health um, which is an area that we're particularly interested in focusing on uh, but also some of the niche manufacturing um, some of the design uh, was also um, prominent in, in terms of the growth there. Very good. Councillor Wiley. Um, John, can you just touch on paragraph 11 on about the relationship that Dunedin has in Shanghai and how the New Zealand government officials quite often want to engage with your connections or the city's connections? Yes, as I said, um, relationships or guanxi is uh, really important. We've got close to 30 years' worth of history with Shanghai, and I think if you read back in the history books, um, you know we were offered that opportunity and we took it. Um, former Mayor Pastor Richard Walls was, was really quick to jump uh, at the opportunity to partner with Shanghai, but I think it's also been our commitment to uh, showing the manaki tanga that we have that has really meant that we've, we've grounded that relationship and activities that have been meaningful for both sides. Um, so we're not just going there and having cups of tea and, and banquet dinners, we're actually laying foundation pieces of work for our cities to benefit. And when they talk about Dunedin being an exemplar of the relationship, I guess that's them expressing that 
you don't just sign an MOU, you don't just sign a, a sister city agreement, you've actually got to make these things work or you become, you default back to a, the bottom of the list um, where you don't take such a, a high priority. Um, the fact we have vice mayors that visit the city, uh, the, the attention that our mayor and others would get at a political level um, is not insignificant and shows the respect that they have for, for Dunedin when we're there. And my second question is around paragraph 14 in China Southern Airlines flying into uh, Christchurch. Um, any indication of um, the, how busy that could be for us? Yeah, I think they're going to start um, daily services um, with that, that service. It, it'll, that'll be big for, for the South Island. Um, there were some figures quoted um, pre-COVID that uh, if a plane landed in Auckland, um, the South Island tended to get about two bed nights out of it. If a plane landed in Christchurch, international uh, flights that is, uh, we tended to get closer to eight. Um, that's because when, when you've got that mobility of people coming into a port and being able to travel around, as we know the Chinese do, they're, they're very experienced travellers. Um, they, will, they will FIT around um, areas. They feel very comfortable driving in New Zealand and, and our conditions. Um, and the, and that, that flight coming directly into Christchurch will benefit um, not only Dunedin but the whole of the Lower South Island. Good. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr Christie. So at this stage, I'm happy to move and seconded by um, Councillor Wiley. And so uh, in speaking to this, uh, I'm very excited to be going and visiting Shanghai. I've never been to China, but uh, I have spent some time with the Vice Mayor of Shanghai and found him a very personal chap. And plus there was a, a whole delega delegation of people that came out here and they're very enthusiastic and interested in Dunedin and things Dunedin. And the uh, part of the, um, our delegation to Shanghai, uh, I've been working on having businesses that are doing a significant trade with Shanghai or with China uh, come to some of the meetings that we're going to have up there. So one in particular uh, with the university having a, an alumni meeting and the other with the Shanghai Chamber of Commerce. And so uh, there will be at least four delegates from businesses in Dunedin, representing Dunedin businesses. Either they are employed by those businesses and live in China, and one in particular will be coming up with us. And those businesses are doing a significant turnover in business with China. So some uh, are exp they're exporting millions of dollars of product uh, to China, and one in particular is importing a large amount of product from China into Dunedin, and then redistributing that uh, with you know, once they've added value to it, around Australia and New Zealand in particular, and employing hundreds of people here in Dunedin by doing that, so we're exemplifying. And my purpose is to exemplify the two-way relationship we have with Shanghai, uh, and uh, for mentioning it now is just to uh, make the point that that uh, relationship and the businesses that are doing trade between here and Shanghai are uh, adding a lot of value to the Dunedin economy. And so uh, similarly, the uh, Mike Collins from the Chamber of Commerce will be coming up with us from, from Business South, will be coming with us. And already he's had several expressions of interest uh, from Dunedin businesses to represent his product in Shanghai. And my expectation is that uh, he will make inroads on that basis and that will add further value to the trip. And I think it's very important uh, for Dunedin that we don't do this in an overt way, but we do it in a, a collaborative way with um, uh, the people of Shanghai, and they are very interested in supporting us because we're much a, very much a smaller player, so I think they view us as a little sister. And as most people with little sisters uh, tend to do, they want to help out their little sister, and I think uh, I feel that uh, benefit to us in their attitude. So hopefully uh, that will be good and useful to us. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. 
I thought I understood the significance of this relationship and, and thank you to staff for this report. Um, but until I went up to China and up to Shanghai, I didn't understand it. And I always remember Mr Christie saying, wait till you get there, you'll, you'll understand. I recall there were 80 sister cities at the time. I don't know if they still have 80 sister cities. Um, and at every point of contact, Dunedin was the top of the pile and definitely the exemplar of sister cities. So I don't know that I'd call us a little sister. Um, I'd say we were a great deal more important than that, potentially. Um, but I, but I, take, I take your reference, um, Mr Mayor. Uh, Guangxi, um, the relationships, and as Councillor Lofiso would say, relationships, relationships, relationships are so important. And I always remember the fact that Consul General at the time couldn't get over how Mayor Cole um, could get to see the Vice Mayor, but it was much harder for her to get to see the Vice Mayor. And that is the significance of the relationship. Just wearing for a moment my study Dunedin hat, um, the education sector is definitely rebuilding. And you will have perhaps remembered the Vice Mayor's comments uh, around, and the Consul General from Christchurch, the um, comments around education, uh, and that certainly is significant to our sister city. Um, the sector is rebuilding uh, in the tertiary sector uh, ahead of expectations, and in the secondary sector in terms of China, slowly and diversely, um, and it's going well. Uh, so um, this will be a very significant visit that you make, Mr Mayor. You will be received uh, with great, what we would call, manakitanga and respect. Um, I sat beside the then CEO of Silverfern Farms when the Vice Mayor was visiting, and there was no doubt in my mind about the significance significance of that business relationship uh, and I also recall at a presentation sometime last year Dr Hu from the University and Professor Mann outlining the extraordinary research opportunities um, that it had through the sister city relationship. I want to also note um, the high regard in which Mr Christie is held he has had relationships with uh, those in Shanghai during his time as CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and since he's been with us in the DCC. And so they are long-standing relationships and held in extremely high regard. So I wish you well for your trip, Mr Mayor, um, and no doubt it will be a continuation of the, um, the warm relationships we have and the impact that that has then for our community in so many different ways, be it education, uh, business, uh, technology and research. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Vandervis. I'd like to propose an alternative view. There's no doubting the significance of trade with China. But there is also no doubting that this trade is significant in every city in the Western world. Most of our manufactured stuff comes from China and China are very adept at doing business with anyone, anywhere. When Councillor Gary says Dunedin is top of the pile, I can't think for a moment why that should be, given all the other cities in the world, hundreds of them that have uh, deals with Shanghai. Um, and I wonder what, what, what it's a pile of. I personally have spent good times. I think I think it's an unfortunate metaphor, uh, Councillor, and I think you know it can easily be. Well, uh, I would certainly be happy to refute it, but so I just think you should withdraw that pile. Okay, I'll team. withdraw the the pile comment. Although I wonder why it came up in the first place. Um, I, I've paid for my own personal tourism to Shanghai um, a number of times, Edinburgh, um, and I can see uh, the real appeal of going to these places because they have such vastly different cultures, they have such vastly bigger infrastructure and incredibly interesting places to visit, and I've absolutely loved it 
uh, going to these places myself. And I can also understand why it is that a lot of Chinese love to come to this part of the world. Uh, they have such overcrowded um, environments where they come from. Um, uh, New Zealand, especially the south here, is seen by them as being an absolute paradise. And of course there's a very strong urge for a lot of the Chinese, especially uh, Chinese in um, positions where they can travel, uh, to come here. Uh, all of these things don't speak so much to sister city value, uh, to me, they speak uh, basically to uh, sister city rate paid tourism. In my view, the 20 years of very expensive uh, rate paid tourism that we had with Otaru have yielded very little other than a few cherry trees at the Otaru room. Um, there has been no significant economic benefit. Um, Otaru is one of Japan's failing small cities. Um, has been for many years now. Point of order, I, once again, I think it's really disrespectful. Yeah, look, um, having entertained the, uh, a, uh, an ambassador from Otaru, Mr Saijo-san, uh, in fact, the, you know, they made a considerable donations to um, this city, and whether there's economic benefit, there certainly have been students from there coming here, and there's quite a significant economic benefit to Dunedin of having their students come to study here. And you know, having those sister city links, in our case, because of that uh, uh, education link, has meant far greater benefit to us than it has done to them. And for all of that, they're very keen to maintain that relationship. So I think it's disrespectful to the relationship and to the work that's gone before. So I'd ask you to withdraw that, please. I'm happy to withdraw, but uh, would make the comment that I actually have some fairly good uh, personal connections with uh, the university and their overseas exchange programs. And uh, the view of at least one uh, member pivotal to that operation is that our sister city uh, visits uh, and sister city relationships have had virtually no uh, positive effect in terms of the number of paying students coming to our university. Um, but I'm just, I'm just offering that as an alternative view. So what I'm saying is that um, you can look at these things and decide that there is economic value and that it is wonderful and that there's a lot of mutual um, uh, sort of um, praise uh, for Shanghai and us in this case, or it used to be, the flavour used to be Otaro and, and before that it was Edinburgh. Um, but if you look at the whole cold hard facts, um, especially regarding any economic benefit, there's very certain economic cost and, in my view, very little certain economic benefit. Um, the, uh Point of order, Mr Mayor. Um, the councillor is misrepresenting the facts. Look, I would point out to uh, you, to the councillor, that th there are some facts in the report, uh, starting with the $200 million you know, Silver Fern Farms relationship, which made a, a very dramatic difference to all of the farmers that uh, were uh, uh, shareholders in that company, and uh, not only to bail them out, but they are enjoying a much better rate of return for all of their products, just as one example. And I've already mentioned some of the businesses that are exporting large amounts of money, and I've got further to add to that. The assumption that this has anything to do with Sister City is uh, falls flat when you consider many other cities that have similar uh, economic relationships with Shanghai, with, with China, and don't have a Sister City um, relationship at all. And yet they have the same massive economic um, trading with China. So the, the assumptions that it's because of uh, our Sister City political people running backwards and forwards um, uh, that creates uh, uh, this kind of economic thing yeah. is, look, is an assumption which I... Point of order, Mr look, Mayor, enough, look, please roll. Whoa, stop, 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 stop. Look, um, the, it's far more, it's not an assumption that people... So, look, I will offer you... Uh, it's not appropriate to be calling it an assumption because there's very clear evidence that it is 
are directly concerned with the sister city relationship. And in fact, I would point to the fact that I've uh, talked to some of these business that do it, people that are doing business with China or those that want to. Uh, and two people are funding their own trips up there. They're already doing business, but they want to uh, maintain or re, uh, to uh, have that the, the have the extra added benefit of our sister city relationship by meeting the people from the mayor's office, mayor of Shanghai's office, and the people from the Shanghai Chamber of Commerce in our company. So one of those businesses is has grown their exports to Shanghai uh, on the basis of our sister city relation. That's exporting seven million dollars a year in product from Dunedin. So they very much value that, and they have an, a delegate up there who's going. But others are paying their own way to come there and be there. So you just need to move on the point of the yes. Yes, so it's not it's not appropriate and disrespectful to the situation. So I'm upholding the point of order. Have you got anything additional or further to say? Or different? Uh, no, I hope to have made my point um, despite the um, points of order. Very good. We have two other speakers, um, Councillor Fiso, Councillor Wiley and then Councillor Hule. Uh, tēnā koe, Mr Mayor. Um, I seem to have caught Councillor Walker's and Councillor Wiley's disease. Uh, tēnā koe, uh, Councillor Vanvis. Um, I just want to uh, re reiterate positive comments that our colleagues have made about this relationship. And as uh, Councillor Gary said, I'm always talking about relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, when we talk about manaki, we're actually talking about manaaki, enhancing the mana of both uh, representatives of the relationship, both partners in the relationship. Uh, for me, it's not just about dollars. It's about relationships and it's about history. And we have to acknowledge more and more in this country the 5th of July 1881 poll tax law passed by this government and Canada's and Australia's to so-called keep this white settler uh, society white. And when we ignore the history of what, we, what was done to Chinese immigrants, um, and we had a, I don't know, Helen Clark apologised and then there was a trust set up, that's just, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of healing that relationship. So it doesn't just go backwards and forwards between Otipoti and Shanghai. It's all the way around. And talking about the residents who suffered here um, as Chinese immigrants and suffered institutional racism and their gifting, they're still, despite that generations of racism, which still occurs today, they graciously gave of themselves and their wairua and their uh, knowledge in terms of what had happened to their people in, in the gold mines in Otago and they offered us the gift and knowledge of Lan Yuan and it's a relationship and so we may know the, the price of everything in terms of dollars but the value of nothing in terms of manaki and aroha. Councillor Wiley. I did say Councillor Walker raises his eyebrows at me. Yes, I've inflicted with that disease. Um, I'm not sure what report Councillor Vandervis is reading. You know, I, I'm really, when I read this, these few pages, it definitely tells a different narrative than what I heard from Councillor Vandervis. But at the same time, that was the same narrative I heard in 2.13, 2.14, 2.15, and I could keep going. But the key aspect that we look at is there's no doubting that the facts are telling a different story. And I'm going to deal with the facts from this report. And I'm going to congratulate John and this team and way. and I know how hard they've been working on this. I know how hard they worked on it through COVID. The relationship is strong. It's important, 
and it's a huge asset for our city. When it clearly states in here that the New Zealand government tap on our door to try and get access into Shanghai, you know the relationship is strong and powerful. The other part is, I don't see many gardens being built like Lan Wan around the world. You know what? They built that, they transported everything from Shanghai to Dunedin. Yeah, I'm not sure they're giving it to their number 35 sister city or number 40 or so on. These are true assets of the relationship. And that's what we need to treasure. And again, I think the report really sums it up nicely. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Councillor Houlihan. I've been afflicted as well. I, I, I would like to say um, that I, I want to apologise to anyone who is offended by the comments of the councillor who spoke earlier because um, I would hate to think that anyone from any of our sister cities heard those comments and thought that's what we were thinking about our relationships with them. Those relationships, have, as we've heard earlier, have been built over years, 30 plus years, with those countries. And I agree once again with Councillor uh, Lafiso that it is about relationships. Anybody in anything you know, around this table, around e any sort of business, it is relationships and it's what you remember. Um, I often remember where I've eaten in places, but I mean, it is the relationships most people remember and work on. And, and it is, I have, as a result, probably, of actually this sister city relationship. I've got a host um, Chinese daughter who stayed, she lived with us for quite a long time, and I met up with her not so long ago, and she gave me a big hug, and, you know, she's like a member of our extended family. I also have about a million Japanese host sisters, um, host daughters, who are fabulous people, and we plan to visit them in Japan. So, you know, but what I've always thought for my children is that that type of relationship lets them know the world is not just Otipoti Dunedin, the world is bigger than that, there's a huge world out there, and plus, if there's ever any type of friction in different countries, what it shows them is that they remember the relationship they have with that with Sayaka or with um, Harumi or with you know our, our sisters and that and daughters that have come from Japan and China and lived in our home and they know them and my son looked at me one day and this one I thought oh I think she's stayed too long he said I love her and anyway sorry I shouldn't have said that for him he might be embarrassed if it gets reported Just wipe that don't report that and and but is is that, you know, they've built up a relationship with those people and it's a very close one for our family. Um, but as Councillor Wiley said, the facts are there right in front of us. So I don't know what the previous councillor was talking about, the evidence of the benefits, not just with relationship, but financially and um, in every other area, like the study for us as a university city, is huge benefits. So to, to say otherwise is absolutely incorrect. Right. Uh, so I think we've said enough about all of this, and I think we'll just put the motion. It's really straightforward. Um, by division, please. By division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wetherill. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12-1. Right. And uh, on that note, uh, I have, can lament that we didn't quite get to 21, but we'll finish there at 19. And uh, <laughs> neither did we get to 5 o'clock, so... <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll see you all again at 9 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, move that we adjourn the meeting until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Is it, it's 9 a.m. It's 9 a.m. In, in the... It's 9 a.m. in my... It's 9 a.m. in my calendar.
Lyndall sent a clarifying email about the time he sent a cheque when we advertised it. Yep. Well, it need to be what yeah. time we advertised it. Yeah, this, well, it's 9 a.m. in my calendar. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'm, I'm we just need to check what time it was advertised. Yeah, yeah, we'll just hang on a minute. We'll need to check what time day two was advertised. We can't start earlier than it was advertised for reasons of transparency. No, but okay. that's, I need to check when it was advertised. Okay. Yeah, we will. To be clear, there will be a clarification email. In the meantime, uh, I move that we adjourn the meeting until the correct time, either 9 or 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, seconded by Deputy Mayor Lucas. All those in favour say aye. Anyone against? Oh, very good.